better patterns. How to use patterns better. Yeah, patterns. Okay, so now we have, see, I'm already teaching you more NLP. This is called the meta model. Okay. What patterns specifically are you trying to work with? I guess that's what I'm here to find out. <laughs> ah, that, there it is right there. See, one of the first rules, again, if you want to apply the critical path of influence that we teach, one of the reasons that our, our approach to NLP makes it so much user-friendly is we have this thing called the critical path of influence. It has six, seven, actually, basic steps. The first one is know your outcome. What is it you want to be able to achieve or what result are you going for? If you don't know what that is, good luck starting because you're going to wind up somewhere else, right? In fact, if you, if you apply the, we call it the universal persuasion protocol. You can learn it in Killer Influence. You can learn it in CPI-1. Um, and in our, we have an NLP Ultra class coming up in it May. So. Yeah, May. Anyway, bottom line is you got to know with what you want. One of the reasons is, is like, for example, if we're going to do hypnotic language pattern, one of the most powerful language patterns, I'm going to give you, I'm going to, we're going to talk about three in this in, tonight, because these three control just about every single function that you're aware of. And most of the ones you're not aware of. Those patterns are awareness, cause and effect, and complex equivalence. Now, you can delete the words complex and equivalence and just say meaning. Because we're not just talking about language patterns. We're talking about primary filters of experience and information at every level of your nervous system. Okay? If you understand awareness, cause and effect, and meaning, you can pretty much change anything you want into anything you want and have it mean whatever you decide it means, right? You can completely ignore things that bother you and focus on the things that build you up. Three patterns of the 60 plus that NLP talks about are like the apex. They control so many things. Now, the challenge when I teach you guys any form of hypnotic language, especially the primal ones, is that one of the side effects of hearing hypnotic language is spontaneous amnesia. You'll get the meaning, it'll go in, it'll have the effect I want it to have, but if I ask you to recall what I said, you literally that way, right? And we, we, the, the effect is so pervasive that we actually had to change, many, many years ago, we had to change how we taught people to use hypnotic language. The last thing we wanted you to do was listen to it. In order for you to install hypnotic language effectively, you need to read it, you need to write it, and you need to speak it. Pretty much in that order, right? Because if you don't understand, it's going to, the, the moment you hear the words, it's going to go in, and because it's coming in on your auditory channel, it's going to overwhelm your language centers. You're going to go into trance. Your brain's going to open up like a like a present on on Christmas on Christmas Day. The stuff's going to go in and then it's going to close. And then when I ask you what I just said, you're like, I don't know, but it'll feel good when I'm doing it. Right. So a lot of times you notice there's candy all over your seats. One of the reasons is, is I have to get you in a highly neuroplastic state. I have to get you guys into a brain state that is, that is conducive to accelerated learning. If we start playing with hypnotic language, your natural seven plus or minus two bits of cognition is going to drop to three. And time is going to slow down. You're going to get the time distortion effect you wanted so badly. And you're going to swear to God and little green apples that you're doing these things wrong until I actually I have you read the patterns out loud. And I'll say, perfect. You're like, huh? Because it's going to change your brain. It will literally, that's actually what the CPI training actually does, is it actually reach, rewires your language centers. Right? But we're going to look at we're going to look at those patterns a little differently in this class because we want to understand what are the effects of these patterns and how can we use them on ourselves. Does that make sense? I will tell you right now, if you understand nothing but the echo technique and these three patterns that I just talked about, you can literally force people to pay attention to you, like you, love you, trust you, feel connected to you. And that's before you use the other language patterns. You can make anybody pay attention to whatever you want and ignore everything else. You can make anything you want seem to cause anything you want in the minds of your listeners or readers, even if those things have absolutely nothing in common and make no logical sense coming together. 
and you can make anything you want mean anything you want in the minds of your listener, even if those two things have nothing to do with each other. It's a byproduct of the way your brain processes the structure of those patterns, right? Going back to this idea of pattern, everything human beings do has a structure and a pattern. And if you understand how to perceive those patterns, then you can begin to create and exert influence over the system. And even if you don't want to exert influence over the system right away, you can at the very least predict what the system's going to do, which makes it extraordinarily useful because now knowing what somebody's going to do or how somebody's going to go about doing it is extremely useful because now you can apply the least amount of influence to get the most amount of change. Does that make sense? Even if it doesn't, that's how the system works. So, uh, Josue, what do you want to learn today? How to stop procrastinating. How to stop procrastinating? You got it, brother. We're going we're gonna to build up to that, okay? So let's talk about the very first pattern. The very first pattern is like this. It's called the mind-body feedback loop. Your physiology controls your psychology, period, okay? You uh, want to look into some of this, you can access uh, Amy Cuddy's work on power poses. How many people have heard of Amy Cuddy? If you haven't, put it on your list. Go watch her TED Talk. Okay. Uh, we've, we've been doing more advanced power pose stuff for decades, but uh, Professor Cuddy actually did the actual research on it. So if you want to go see what she's discovered, you can go read her stuff and watch her, power, her, uh, her TED Talk. The first thing to understand is that for every psycho-emotional state that you have, there's a corresponding posture and breathing that facilitates it, that allows you to access it or not access it. That's the first pattern or the first structure we're going to work with. We call it the mind-body feedback loop. Now, to really take advantage of this and utilize it effectively, one of the things that we have to understand is we have to actually change the way we think about that because all of us, nobody here has, has never picked up a self-help book. Okay. Nobody here has ever not gone to YouTube looking for an answer to something to fix their shit. Okay. If you pick up a lot of books, you're, you're going to hear this one thing come out is that the mind controls the body. Anybody ever hear that? Mind controls the body. Okay. Write it down, cross it out, throw it out. Because it's, fun, it's functionally bullshit. Wait a minute. What? I can hear all the psychologists and behavioral therapists in the universe and all the dead ones spinning in their grave as I say this. Mind controlling the body is true enough to be true if you're trained or lucky, okay? I spent over 17 years in clinical practice fixing the product of other people's shit, manifest, people manifesting shit in their lives. You know, you ever, how many people are familiar with this thing called the law of attraction, right? You guys understand that disease is negative manifestation, right? Why this is one of the reasons why disease is so fucking prevalent in our society, every society really, is that we're not taught how to manage these things. Second of all, your autonomic nervous system has a four to one negativity bias. Let me explain that to you. A good thing happens to you. Your nervous system assigns a gravity of one, right? One good thing, one point of gravity, right? On the positive side. One negative thing happens. Nervous system assigns a gravity of four. So the nervous system is already weighted towards moving you in a negative direction. Now, why would new Mother Nature and the universe do that shit? Because it gets you off your ass and moving. Your nervous system doesn't actually care about your mental health. It doesn't care about your psychological well-being. It cares about keeping your heart beating, keeping your blood in your veins, and moving your genes forward. And as long as your genes are moving forward and your heart is beating and the organism is alive, the unconscious mind has done its job. Okay. I don't make these rules. I'm just reporting them. So you have to understand about this four to one negativity bias. Nobody's broken here. Nobody online is broken. It feels that way. It feels that way because the system that the universe built into you for those times in your life when bad shit happens. What does that mean? Someone violates your physical boundaries. Someone violates your mental boundaries. Sometimes when we think of trauma, we tend to think of it as these massive, like, you know, driving down the highway, getting T-boned by a Mack truck, getting pulled behind a dumpster and being violated in some way. But a lot of times, the things that traumatize us 
are iterative. In other words, it's it's the buildup of a lot of little similar things over time until it reaches a critical mass. And then we have to deal with it, right? But what happens a lot of times is we don't make the change until we've suffered enough. And that's one of the things when you come to like one of my, if you come to see Moss or or me or, or whoever I'm, I'm, I'm promoting as, you know, my, my trainers or my associates, first thing we're going to do is make sure that you're actually ready to change to make sure that you're actually ready to do the things that are necessary to get free. And I'm going to tell you what some of those things are right now. A, you got to follow instructions. Okay? B, you got to participate. Which means if I say, lift your hands up, lift your fucking hands up. Right? If I say, dance around like a crazy person, dance around like a crazy person. Why? Because one of the biggest things that holds us back is we're afraid of making a fool of ourselves. We're afraid to be playful. And I'm telling you right here, right now, that you can deal with the most heinous fucking things on the planet if you can be playful and you can approach it with a playful energy. Because the studies are there. When an FBI hostage negotiator goes into a hostage negotiation situation and he is more relaxed, playful, easygoing, he is up to 31% more aware, more versatile, more adaptable, more persuasive. And his counterpart, the hostage taker, the bad guy, is up to 31% more compliant. Now think about that. What if 31% more people in your life said yes to you? Would that change things? What if you were 31% better? at everything would that be useful guess what you got to do have fun and be playful with it gamify everything seriously why do you think apps are so popular they're all engineered to do the one thing that you're, you're hardwired for dopamine rushes pleasure right there's a whole there's a whole industry based on how to dope how to gamify apps and gamify home uh, home study courses and shit like that i know i bought it Right. There's a if you want to do the even deeper research, there's ones that's called uh, Addiction by Design. It's a little denser book, and it's about how they engineer slot machines in Las Vegas. This shit's being done to you deliberately, folks, because people are there's people who've known about this for a long time. But once you understand it, and you do a few basic principles, you can use it instead of just having it used on you. But, and the best part is, I'm going to tell you this, but you don't have to believe it. This works even if you don't believe it. I spent a lot of time and a lot of years distilling this shit down to a simple set of mechanics. If you just embrace what I'm telling you and do it, whether you believe it or not, you will start to feel changes. The only thing I can't predict is scope and duration. That's all unique to you. You all have your own nervous system. You've been using them certain ways. You have certain things that are going to make you better at this, certain things that might slow you down. But each and every one of you is unique in that way. But that, that being said, what we're going to deal with tonight, what we're going to deal with tonight are all the things you have in common. You all have this one little subroutine or set of systems in your neurology that control everything else. Think of it like coming off the assembly line with the same, like when you go to pick up your new iPhone, right? All the iPhones that come off the assembly line, they're all set the same way, right? Till you get your hands on it, you start customizing the shit out of that thing, right? NLP teaches us that pretty much, my form of NLP anyway, teaches us that people are pretty much the same way. There are certain default settings in your nervous system that you all have. And then you have ones that are more personalized. The first one we're going to deal with and the first one we're going to start to experiment with is the pattern or the, the process of your physiology controlling your psychology. So let me, let me go ahead and close this loop really quick. I said that most people are taught that your mind controls your body, and that's true if you're trained. Or you come in as a, some kind of savant or some, with some kind of gift in a certain application where you can just do those things easier. But for the vast majority of humans, it's actually the opposite. Your physiology 
controls your psychology. Your posture and breathing actually dictate more about your mental and emotional states at any given moment than any other factor, with the exception of maybe the environment, but I'm pretty sure it'll, it can trump the environment too. Okay, not to be confused with any orange skinned former presidents. Right? Well, I see, I see we have to have some fun. Everybody stand up. It's that time. We're gonna run our first and our first superpower state control technique. I want you to walk up to somebody to your immediately to your right, immediately to your left, stick your hand out, look them in the eye and go, blah, 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 blah. come on, let's go raspberry each other. Get good at it. Come on, show me what you're working with, girl. Blah, 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 blah. Come on. <laughs> there we go. All right. That's what I like. I give points for the best raspberry. Hey, all right. We have the competitors in the room. All right. All right. All right. So why do we do this stupid drill every single time? A, it gets you over the one thing that is going to hold most of you back if you're making a fool of yourself. It's, I'm serious. Seriousness is a kiss of death. Seriously. The other is because I am, in fact, a covert hypnotist, allegedly one of the best in the world. I can, in fact, get you to do shit you don't want to do. All right. So. Physiology controls your psychology. All you need to do to get to, to be able to do anything I'm going to share with you tonight is follow the instructions, get your body involved, be playful, learn how to be focused and absorbed. Now, we've covered the first three or four of them, but let's talk about focus and absorption really quick before we get into drills, because we're going to do a lot of drills tonight. What do I mean when I say focus? Or let's talk about absorption first, because a lot of people think they know what I mean when I say absorption. So how many people here, by a show of hands, have ever been little children? Okay, this means I know the answer. This means I don't. This means, oh, shit, I hope he doesn't call on me. All right? By the way, I'll give you my disclaimer really quick. If politically incorrect language, colorful metaphors, swearing, or the word boobies offends you, there's a door. Not the place for you to be tonight. Not for the next two or three hours, anyway. I don't, my intention is never to offend anyone, but my style is very provocative. If I say something and you feel a sudden emotional spike, point to where you feel it, write it down, because there's something there that needs fixing, right? We're going to talk about bucket listing tonight, which is actually a little bit more advanced technique for doing work on yourself. Most of the people in this room are here to fix their own shit. True, not true, right? Okay, so that's going to be the focus, learning how to fix your own stuff. The first one is learning how to control your state, how to realize when you're in a less than positive state and the exact physical and mechanical steps that you can use to break it, to interrupt the pattern so you can choose something else. Okay. For the most of us, the untrained people in the world, our states sneak up on us. We don't realize we're in a shitty state until we're in it. Okay. One of the one of my first jobs as your teacher is to show you how to become progressively more self-aware, how to become more aware of the things that trigger you, where they're coming from, where they started, so you can choose how to respond to it. So the first thing I want us to do is I want us to stand up. We're going to go right into this drill, and I'm going to come back and close the loop on absorption and focus, and then we might do this drill again just to see if there's any difference. I want you guys to think back to a time in your life when you saw something that you really, 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 wanted. I mean, on a scale of zero to 10, it was like a lust factor of 27. Now, this is something you actually got, okay? But it was something that you saw it, you knew you knew you wanted it, you knew you were gonna do whatever it took to get it, and you made a plan, and you put that plan into action, and whatever got in your way, whatever things came out of nowhere, you went over, around, through, you worked that plan, you adapted, you modified, and boom, you nailed it. Home run. I want you to close your eyes and remember that moment of victory. That moment when you realized that everything you've been working for, everything you were going after was yours. You nailed it. Home run. I want you to remember that realization, that moment of victory. And I don't care if it was something that happened when you were six. Maybe you won the Easter egg hunt. 
I don't care if it was graduating college, high school. I don't care. Remember how you were feeling in that moment. Remember what you were seeing, what you were smelling, what you were tasting. Because when you do that, when you see what you see and you hear what you hear and you smell and you taste what you smell and you taste, there is an amazing, wonderful feeling that you get. A feeling of absolute victory. And I'd like you to notice that there's a place in your body where those feelings start, where they grow, where they spread from. As you allow that energy to grow and spread, I want you to allow your body to step back into the way you were sitting or standing when you realized that moment of victory. Breathe the way you were breathing when you realized that moment of victory. Okay? Excellent. And we're going to build on this feeling shortly. But make sure you're standing and breathing the way you were breathing and standing when that victorious moment occurred to you, for you. Now, here's the instruction. Without changing a single thing about the way you're standing, without changing a single thing about the way you're breathing, as an act of will, try to feel bad. You may notice it's really, really hard, and that's okay. When you're done testing, stop. Let that wonderful feeling come all the way back, flooding back even stronger. Not that it went anywhere. If you're doing this right, right. Now, what I want you to do is, I want you to look, notice inside where that energy started from, and notice there's a color connected to that feeling. What color of colors would that be for you? First impression. Whatever it is, imagine a brilliant ball of that energy floating above your head. Notice how the feelings in your body shift and change as with every breath you take and every beat of your heart, that ball of energy begins to grow, begins to expand, begins to fill the entire room from floor to ceiling, from wall to wall and all points in between. Notice how it wraps itself around you like an amazing blanket of victory, a cocoon, a shield, a suit of armor, insulating you, protecting you from all defeats. All bosses, real or imagined, while at the same time flooding your mind, flooding your body, flooding your spirit with everything it most wants, everything it most needs, and an infinite, ever expanding and unlimited supply. And when you know you've got that, breathe those amazing colors through your entire being. Let it fill you up like water fills up a bottle, like fluid fills up a test tube like hot air helium fills up a balloon, anchor it in so fully, so completely, no force in the universe can turn it off or take it away, not even you. And when you realize it's true, test it. Try to turn it off, try to take it away, and notice what happens instead. That's right. Breathe it in. Doing great. When you're satisfied, Stop testing, open your eyes, notice how good you feel. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? You just did real magic. That's real magic right there. Okay? But it's neuromagic. It's magic mediated by the power and the, the agency of your autonomic nervous system. Okay? Now, you guys ready to try the other side of this? All right, we won't do this one very long. I want you to usually I have people turn around and look at Richard for this one, but no, we don't want to paint him with anything negative. This one, we're going to go the opposite direction now. We're going to start to experiment. Now, how many people noticed, just by a show of hands, what happened when I had you hold the posture, hold the breathing, and try to feel bad? What happened? Could you, could you access? He says, uh, go ahead. It felt as if you, there was like a shield that was impenetrable by any. Negative emotion. Oh, so what you're saying is you can't follow instructions. Basically. Because I told you to use all your willpower and try to fucking, no, you can do it. For that moment, you, I could not. You mean you, when your physiology is engaged properly, you, you can't access your willpower? What? Now, what do you think would happen if we used physiology that was in harmony with our willpower? You think maybe you'd get a hole that's greater than the sum of the parts? You see, the biggest thing about this drill 
is that if your physiology and your willpower, again, caveat being if you're untrained, if your physiology and your willpower are in conflict, guess what wins? Physiology wins. And this is why when you come to like CPI or killer influence, our influence trainings, why we spend almost an entire day on physiology. Because your physiology is the most bulletproof form of state control and proof against negative emotions that you have. You come right off the assembly line with it. Moss and I are part of a Buddhist mysticism class. And my other students who are, in, who are taking the class, we had to skip it tonight because we're doing this. You know what they said? Your posture equals your state. Now, I didn't come to it through that training. It's corroboration. This is not new. <laughs> Confirmation, ding. But this is a big one. There is no state that you have or that you can generate that you can't break the minute you change your posture and your breathing and hold it for at least two minutes. Now that's the old research from Dr. Amy. You start building in color and memory and all the other aspects. Now you get a hold that's greater than the sum of the parts. But if your physiology isn't right, you're gonna have to fight it. Guess what happens when you try to fight it? Right now, to wax a little bit more negative, this is one of the reasons why cults, uh, thought reform specialists, in other words, mind control motherfuckers, MK Ultra people, this is why they spend so much time breaking down your physical body, exhausting you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, because the moment your physiology goes to shit, your willpower goes out the window too, and you go into survival mode and you dissociate. Your identity starts to fragment, and now they can put it back together however they want it, right? They might even put you under house arrest for two and a half years, right? <laughs> Some of you got that, right? So let's start using it the right way. Let's start using it to make our lives better instead of putting us in the, the, the slavery of other people who know how to do this. But I want to show you one more thing. I want you to have another experience really quick, and then I'll close the, the loop on the absorption and focus thing. I'm going to ask you to remember another time in your life. Now, this one's not quite the same, but it has a very similar structure. I want you to think back to a time in your life when you saw something you really, 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 really wanted. Just like before, on a scale of 0 to 10, it had a lust factor of 27. And once again, you made a plan. And you put that plan into operation. You guys can have this. Well, I'm actually can't sit down yet. Sorry. I want to make, I know you guys have been standing a long time, but hey, um, you put that plan into operation. But right when you thought you were going to get it, right when you thought you had it nailed, something came along and just whoop, snuff, snuffed it right out from under you. I want you to remember that moment of disappointment, that moment when you realized it wasn't going to happen for you. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to remember what you were seeing in that moment. Remember what you were hearing. Remember what you were smelling, what you were tasting. We're not going to stay here very long. Remember how you were standing, if you were standing. Remember how you were sitting, if you were sitting. Remember how you were breathing. When you have it, without changing a single thing about the way you're standing or sitting, about the way you're breathing, summon up your willpower, and as an act of will, try to feel good. You may notice it's a little difficult. Now I want you to summon up your willpower again. And this time I want you to hold, use your willpower and hold on to that negative feeling. But as you hold on to that, as you try to hold on to that negative feeling with your willpower, shift your physical body back to the winner's triumphant physiology and notice what happens. Shift back to the winner's physiology. And then when you realize how futile it is to hold on to that feeling, just let it go and let your mind become fully engaged in the new physiology. There we go. Open your eyes, look up here. Tell me what you discovered. What'd you learn? It changed your mood. You changed your posture? You, what, you mean you, you couldn't hold on to the negative feeling? 
Damn it. I told you, you got to follow instructions. Namisha, what happened? The physiology took over. What'd you notice? Same as it was. Exactly. Now, here's the thing. This is the worst you'll ever be at it. It's a skill. You just got to know to do it, right? Remember I told you my first job as a teacher? What'd you learn, Joe? Same thing? Yeah, perfect. You guys now know more about how to control your state than most fucking humans on the planet. No substance is involved. But, this is a big but, not like my big but, but anyway. Have a seat. Give yourselves a big round of applause. That's good. All right. If you only do it tonight, it's just a parlor trick. Understand? I gave you, to, I gave you basically two or three drills. You think about positive state, physiology, negative state. There's actually benefit, believe it or not, in learning to practice both ends of the polarity. But because of the negativity bias inherent in our nervous system, we always feel the negative shit stronger. Now, there is a couple of rules of thought that you can apply to any negative feeling that you're experiencing. You guys know what a funhouse mirror is? Okay, so you know that you go into a funhouse, you got all these different mirrors, right? You walk into one mirror and maybe you look normal, you get one right next to it, and all of a sudden you look 12 feet tall and this thin, right? Your nervous system applies the funhouse mirror effect to every emotion that you have. When you have a positive one, it's like looking into a regular mirror or as close to a regular mirror as possible. When you experience a negative state, it's like looking at one that makes you four times bigger. So the idea here is anytime you feel bad in, from your perspective in any way, realize that the thing you're most afraid of, the thing that's bothering you the most is only about 25% as bad as you're making it out to be. Now that can be as high as six times based on the work from Chris Voss and some of the other people. So anywhere between four and six. So think about that. Your nervous system is designed to make the scary shit scarier than it actually is. Um, question. It's all right. Don't be sad. I love questions. Mm -hmm. But um, how do you like gauge it when it's for like on the positive end? On the positive? Like if it's a fun house mirror as well, like. How so do you the science is telling us that the, our evaluation of positive experiences, if we don't do anything with it, I'm going to show you how to do stuff with your nervous system tonight mm -hmm. to modify all of this. Mm -hmm. Right. But in the unmodified average human being right off the rack, this is how it works. You get a pretty good one-to-one -one ratio for the positive stuff. But the moment something goes negative, even though it's one thing, we think it's like four things. Well, usually they have like a heavier impact mm -hmm. and are more detrimental, like a positive yep. thing could happen. But like, say something like death is death. It's kind of like, mm -hmm. there's like, or like whatever ruin happens. You know, it's like you, you, access, you have a negative thought and then it starts a cascade effect because the moment you have that, the first thing your neurology wants to do is, has we ever felt this way before? And start, it starts opening up files. Yeah. And now you get this cumulative gravity effect. Now, for those of you who are interested in, in the dynamics of that, there's a new book that I've been, I've been promoting for a while. It's called um, How Emotions Are Made by Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. And it's, called, it's on what we call the theory of constructed emotions. You don't actually have an emotion when you first encounter a situation. What you have is an interoceptive sensation. In other words, your body generates a feeling, but it's not an emotion until you assign a meaning to it. And that's important. It's the, remember I said there's three, three filters? Awareness, cause and effect, meaning. Every emotion that you have has, has a label to it. It's not an emotion until you put the label on it. And then the moment you put the label on the feeling, a whole bunch of other files open up. And now you get the accumulated weight of those other memories. That's why when you regress people to cause, a lot of times, and those of you who are therapists will, tell, will, tell, will verify this, the thing coming into this, the, the, the problem the person's coming into the clinic with is lying to you. They don't know it. 
They, they think, you know, they're coming in for something that happened when they were 35. Well, you get them in the chair and you talk to the unconscious mind, you say, go back to the very first scene, situation, or event that is the source, the beginning, the root cause of XYZ. All of a sudden, they're five years old, watching their mom and dad argue or watching somebody get beat up or they're getting beat up. Or Sometimes, as often as many people in the regression class recently discovered, a lot of times the causal event is just them alone in a room at night and nothing is going on. But to a three-year-old, that's super traumatic. And so it becomes like a little hook that everything is linked on to. And when you encounter something in your external environment, your body generates a sensation. The body says, has we ever felt this feeling before? And what did we do about it? We did this. What emotion did we call it? Boom. And now all the files open. And now you're no longer responding to what's in front of you. You're actually responding to what happened way back then. Now that's going to be important later on. Because most of the time when someone's standing in front of you, that for some reason you're just mad at, you just hate them and don't know why, or you've been that person, it wasn't personal. You just happened to trigger a memory and you were standing in the line of fire and got painted with that brush. This is how we work. I don't, you know, so there was some, uh, John had a question and then Denisha and then, um, yeah. <laughs> A lot of the time when people have like a false idea of why they feel a certain way or a false idea of what a trigger may, might be, mm -hmm. uh, they were actually told that false oh, yes. information from another person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then become, because people become hyper suggestible under any form of extreme emotion or in the presence of overwhelming authority. Is that light on? Okay. This is, again, this is not the class for these things. We get programmed in. Here's the thing. And again, my job as your teacher, and whether this is your first time and only time with us, or whether you continue to come back to these free events or whatever, my, my first job as your teacher, A, is to show you what's possible, but primarily to help you become more aware. Aware of what's going on inside of you and aware of the influences being perpetuated upon you from the outside. Because without awareness, there is no choice. First, David's, one of David's first rules of influence, anything outside of your awareness is outside of your control. Addendum to David's first rule of influence. Just because you're not aware of it doesn't mean it isn't controlling you or influencing you. You will not avoid influence. You will not avoid being influenced. What you can do is become aware of the influence that's being leveraged on you, both internally and externally, and deciding which ones to let in, which ones to ignore, which ones to change, and how to respond to it. You're not going to avoid it. So you better learn how to manage it. Right? And that's part of why your physiology has to come first. Because 99% of the time, when bad shit happened, we weren't, at the, we weren't having a great day. We were unaware. We were in our head somewhere, not paying attention and already in a funkadelic state. And all of a sudden, the shit came. Right? Every now and then, we get taken by surprise. But for the most part, our state has a lot to do with what we're aware of in our environment. Okay, so uh, Namisha had a question. So when you're in the neg when you know that you're going to that negative state, do we pattern interrupt there and and go into positive, not go deep into The minute it. you feel the negative state coming on, change your posture, change your breathing, and physically distance yourself. Physically distance yourself, right? In influence training, we actually do the opposite. We'll actually approach someone, give them an eyebrow flash, and actually press on them a little bit, and then step back and watch them follow up. But when we want to control our state, one of the first things that has to happen is you have to become aware that your state is changing make a decision to change it or stop it, get physical and emotional distance. The, way, the best way to get, to remind yourself to get emotional distance is to make physical distance happen. Change your posture, change your breathing. If you can't change the proximity, change your posture, change your breathing, right? Those are the two mainstays. Everything else is an option. If you can hold that state, hold that posture and you hold that breathing pattern, you will be immune to the state. Now, let me be clear on that. 
you will still feel the pull to go into that state. How many of you noticed when you were holding the positive physiology and I asked you to try to feel bad, your body wanted to change? This means yes. That's what you must be aware of. Your neurology is sensing that it's, it's, it's from its perspective, the imposition of a negative state or going into a negative state. And so the first thing that changes is your body. But if you interrupt that, that impetus to change your physiology, you can't go into the state. And this is where what Amy's science or Dr. Cuddy's science helps us to understand. If I can do that for as little as two minutes. Now, actually, you don't even need to do it for that long, but two minutes is a really good training interval, right? Two minutes, your physiology and blood chemistry will start, no, your, your psychology, your, your emotional state will start to change actually quicker. Your blood chemistry will start to change in two minutes. Like literally, you'll get more testosterone, you'll get more cortisol, your cortisol will go down, your testosterone will go up, you'll feel more confident, you'll feel more assertive, you'll feel more relaxed. But you got to hold it. And this is why in so many of these Qigong disciplines, you're standing there and you're holding these postures for hours. Well, if two minutes, in case you didn't know this, a two minute posture resulted in up to a 20% increase in testosterone and a 20% decrease in cortisol. So think about this for a moment, all energetics aside, if holding a posture for two minutes can potentially up your testosterone by 20%, what does holding a posture like this for an hour are gonna do? Right? What, think about it for a moment, if the science is true, right? And there's been, some people have been able to replicate this, some people have not, the, let me explain that. Some people have had trouble replicating the blood chemistry shift, but every group got a state shift. So if I have to choose between feeling good and having blood chemistry that shows it, or just feeling good, guess what I'm gonna choose, right? Okay, so the books, if you wanna do the science, read up on the science behind this, you can get will, the, Book one is called Willpower by Dr. Roy Baumeister. It's about willpower depletion theory. Um, there's another book called The Power of Bad, also by Baumeister. Right? That's where a lot of the science I'm giving you is coming from regarding the negativity biases in your neurology and things of that nature. Okay. If you're running teams or you're, in a, um, you're working, you have a, a team, you need to read that, that book, The Power of Bad. Because the science is there. If you surround a negative person or a, a low performing person with good people, they don't raise the good person up. They pull the rest, the guy, that one person pulls the rest of the team down. Right? You would think with enough magnitude, you could just, but it doesn't work that way. So once again, it goes back to this. Have you ever heard the old expression, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are? Can't fly like an eagle when you're surrounded by turkeys? Right? More true than not. I don't, again, I don't make the rules. I'm not out here to offend or, or, or piss off anyone. But look, you ain't going to make your world the way you want it to be until you're ready to deal with it the way it is. And that starts with you, your inner world, and then your outer world. Does that make sense? Okay. So your physiology controls your psychology. Period. First thing you want to do before you do anything else, control your posture. First of all, know what you want. Second, control your posture, control your breathing. Then you start, once you've broken whatever state that's holding you back or limiting you, now you start taking on the physiology of something you want more of. Remember a time in your life when, fill in the blank, right? Now, how do we make that better? Would you guys like to make it better? This means yes, this means no, there will be a test. Okay, so... We're going to do a variation of the color breathing exercise that we started with. Now, in the Planet David, that exercise has a name besides color breathing or the color game. It's called Resonant Frequency Generator. It was something that I modeled from studying with uh, Brent Baum, who was the founder of Holographic Memory Resolution. I found out that there was this one little nugget in, in his system that made 99% of the change possible. And we, I call it Resonant Frequency or Resolution Frequency Generator. Your body can process anything that you can turn into a color. 
your body can turn anything into a color that you can point to. So if you can point to where you feel it, you can change it. Now, the secret is, what am I changing it to? And here's the magic question to do that. What do I want instead? Your nervous system is one of the most pathologically driven question answering mechanisms on the planet. It must, beyond all reason, seek to answer any question you give it, no matter how stupid the question is. And you've all experienced this. How many of you have ever met somebody, or maybe you've been this person who says, why does this always happen to me? Maybe you've been that person, right? Your unconscious mind is down there listening, going, oh, motherfucker wants a list. There you go. And all of a sudden, all the reasons why you're a piece of shit come floating up out from your unconscious mind. And because you created it, you don't resist it. Rule number two, what the nervous system creates the nervous system accepts. Human beings don't resist themselves. They can't. They don't want to, first of all, but they actually can't. One of my, one of my colleagues, Scott Sandlin, used to say, because he was one of the leading experts on dental pain control, he would say, your nervous system is designed to make everything you affra you, you're afraid of or, or painful, the most painful it can be for you. Not for other people. For you. And it goes back to this idea of what we call self generation bias. Anything your neurology selects or creates, your neurology will select for, for if it has to choose. Right? So, huh? Okay. So, here's my favorite metaphor for this. How many people here know what a kidney is? How many people have at least one? <laughs> okay, good. So, let's say for something, no, this will be zero manifestation, but let's say that. I go to the doctor and he does a biopsy on one of my kidneys. And I find it finds out one of my kidneys is failing and I'm going to need a transplant. I'm going to need a new kidney. Now, because of cutting edge breakthrough medical science, I have two choices. I have the opportunity to get a transplanted kidney or they can, they can pull some stem cells out of my healthy kidney and clone me a brand new kidney. Now, which one's going to work? Both. Which one has less chance of being rejected? The one that came from me in the first place. That's how you work. Every thought, every belief, every trauma you created. Remember, you are not, this is important, you are not the way you are because of the things that happened to you. you repeat that. You are not the way you are because of the things that happened to you. You are the way you are because of the way you recorded the things that happened to you and the way you have been relating to those recordings. Human beings labor under the illusion, two, two big delusions. The first one is that your memories are real, that they are, in fact, the thing that happened to you. And the science is showing us from forensics to, to neurology to uh, you know, uh, social psychology, your, your memories change the more times they're reconstructed. You don't recall memories, you rebuild them. And every time you rebuild a memory, it's a little different. Now think about that. Think about it and the ramifications of it for a moment. Every time you recall a shitty memory, it's less representative of what actually happened, but you don't know that. Because of the inherent negativity bias, it will be tend to be made worse. See how it all kind of conspires and spirals until you understand the system. So here's a thought. If the memories that you have aren't even accurate, they're not even the thing that happened. Why not change it to something else instead? Get rid of the story, create a new one. And the energy changes, your trauma is released, and you're healthier. All of your thoughts, all of your memories, all of your beliefs, all of your desires, fantasies, daydreams 
are built the same way from the same stuff. And if you understand that system, you can change anything you want into anything you want, but it does require you to play. The more you play with your nervous system, the more powerful you get. Would you like to play with your nervous system? Let's talk about absorption and focus. You thought I was going to forget. Okay, so by show of hands, once again, enthusiastically, how many people have ever little children? All right, very cool. So um, what's your name again? Amy, did you have a question? I think we forgot to get your question. Okay, so Amy, when you were a little girl, did you play pretend? Okay, so when you played pretend, were you like a tomboy or a tom girl? Okay, tom girl, excellent. How many other tom girls we got in the room? Don't have to be a girl to be a tom girl, by the way. We're inclusive that way. All right, how many tom boys we have? How many are non-binary toms? Okay. <laughs> You got to take it. You got you to gotta laugh at yourself. One of the, again, remember, I was in private practice for 17 years. And the biggest problem that we have is that we live in a culture. And this is before the whole hashtag movement and the cancel culture hit. This is before that ran. ran. We live in a society that systematically teaches us to not say shit, not to express ourselves, to hold things in. And that is where 99% of our illnesses come from. Everything from STDs to COPD to Parkinson's, MS, most forms of cancer, and I've dealt with it. I had a, I had a little girl once. I shouldn't say little. She was like 16 or 17 years old. She actually started out as one of my wife's patients. She, had, she was in high school, and one day she woke up, and her right hand just stopped working. It may have been coming on for you know a little while, but she just thought it was a cramp or something. One day it just stopped. And so she went to the doctor, she went to the neurologist, she went to the, I think she went to even a psychic. I mean, she went everywhere, right? And that, that was over the course of several months. In the interim, she still had to go to school. She still had to, so she trained herself to write with her left hand. And then one day it stopped. At this time, she's going to see my wife for acupuncture. My wife is a brilliant acupuncturist, brilliant herbalist. And my wife got real good really early on at spotting shit that was not caused physically. So she, she, she reached out to me. She said, look, got this young girl. Her hands don't work. And I'm like, I think she needs you. I said, okay, bring her in. We'll, we'll give her, we'll do a consult. And if she passes the consult, then we'll do, you know, we'll see what we can do with her. So that that time, I was really focused on regression therapy. So we brought her in and we regressed the cause. And what we discovered, first of all, let me give her, you a little background on her, Orthodox Catholic background. Now, nothing against the Catholic church, but nothing does guilt better than religion. Okay. And this girl, when we regressed the cause, we found the triggering event. Somehow, some way, while she, her, all, her entire circle of friends just disintegrated and ostracized her, just banned her, kicked her out, shunned her. And she and her boyfriend broke up with her and just all at one time. And she was so hurt and so upset, but she wouldn't let herself express it. She wouldn't confront anybody. She wouldn't, she wouldn't cry. She wouldn't, she, she just locked it all in. She refused to express so we went through whatever process we needed for her to get resolution on that, regress the initial sensitizing event, cleared it all up. By the end of the session, both hands were working. Right? One of my by proxy mentors, the late Stephen Parkhill, whose focus was terminal cancer, actually became one of my focuses for a short time in the clinic. Here's what he said. He said, you will run out of body parts long before your unconscious mind runs out of ideas for getting your attention. Every form of illness, in my opinion, that we express is exactly that. It's a message conveyed in the form of a somatic metaphor. It's a manifestation of what? Unre unresolved memories and the energy it generates 
But here's the best part. None of you are broken. You've been just doing fucked up shit. It's just something you're doing. And you can always change what you're doing. This isn't magic as you, you know, in, in the sense that we can't explain it. It's magic in the sense that when you understand how your nervous system does this, you can choose to do something else. You can choose to change it. But there is a price. You have to give up being fucked up. Now, for some people, that's great. For others, it's a little terrifying. Because that means you can't rely on the same old messages. Right? These are one of the things that we sort for when you come into our, our clinic. Are you ready to be different? Are you ready to let go of the things that are holding you back so you can have something else? Here's the rub. Your unconscious mind is predisposed to sorting for what's familiar. Mm -hmm. If it has a choice in many cases between doing a pain it's had for 20 years and something, some new and exciting technique that has an uncertain outcome, guess what it will choose? Not right or wrong. It's just how you're built. But you do have the power to change it. So absorption. When you're a little child playing pretend, how many of you were like played soldier? Anybody play soldier? Any superheroes? School teacher? Not so much. Queen of England? <laughs> he still does Santa, right? When you were a little child playing pretend, we use this, I use my soldier metaphor, right? You're a little five year old out in the backyard. You pick up a stick, you're going to play soldier. You're holding a stick in your hand. And the five-year-old part of you knows it's just a stick for about the first six and a half minutes. Six and a half minutes later, it, you're really Rambo. It's really an M60 or an M60. You're going, kill, 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 die, 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 right? And you're having, you're chucking and you're jiving and the bad guys are jumping all around till mom calls for lunch. Now, you guys ever have moments where you just got so lost in playing pretend? Let me ask you a question. Were you asleep? Were you asleep? No. Were you having a ball? Were you really absorbed in what you were doing? My friends, if you can just do that, you can make any change that you want. You just got to put the pieces together in the right way. What does that mean? Be playful. Be absorbed like your five-year-old playing pretend. Point to where you feel it and just follow the instructions and you can change it. Okay? So, focus. How many people have ever been to this thing called a movie? All right. So, if you haven't been to a movie, you need to get out more. Right? So, maybe you can relate to this. You're walking into the movie theater, you got your big bucket of popcorn in one hand, best guy or girl on the other. You're walking down the aisle wondering which one's going to be more fun. Okay? You sit in the chair, the lights go down, the curtain opens. For the next two and a half hours, you don't know what the, everything else just disappeared, right? Unless you're watching one of those damn Marvel movies, in which case four and a half hours later, your bladder's screaming at you, but you're still not getting up, right? And during that time, they could shoot off a gun next to you and you wouldn't notice. Why? Because you were both absorbed and focused. That's what we're talking about when we talk about absorption and focus. It's the same thing you do every single day when you go to the movies or when you play pretend. You can do that. You got it. Right? Every now and then I ask, how many people have ever been little children? Some motherfucker in the back is going, not me. I grew up with computational models. I came out of a test tube fully formed. Get the fuck out. Right? This ain't the right meetup for you. Right? Go to the biohackers union or something. Right? So, colored breathing, what do I want instead? The secret to this is if you can make a movie of what you want instead, strong enough that it generates a body feeling, you can use that body feeling to change any other feeling in your body. That's it. But there are ways to amplify the movie. We're gonna play with that. We're gonna start by understanding how your nervous system makes things bigger and stronger. So, you guys wanna play? 
How many of you, by a show of hands, can feel good for no fucking reason? Okay. If you haven't, then you got to watch my you want to watch my channel more often. Everybody, stand up. Has this been useful so far? Okay. I want you to close your eyes. We call this the frame game. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think of a time in your life when you felt the most amazing, thrilling, fulfilling, satisfying pleasure ever. Ooh, not that one. Okay, make it that one if you want. I don't care. I'm not the pleasure police. I'm not the pleasure police. I don't care what, who you were with, what you were doing, how many state lines you crossed, what substances were involved. If the condom, I don't care, right? It can be anything. It can be the most spiritual experience you've ever had. It can be the simple joy of biting into a freshly baked chocolate cook, chip cookie right out of the oven. It could be a sexual romantic experience. I don't care. All I care about is that when you remember that amazing feeling, when you see what you see and you hear what you hear and you smell and you taste what you smell and you taste, there's an amazing, wonderful, pleasurable sensation that you get. And I'd like you to notice that there's a place in your body where those amazing feelings start, where they grow, where they spread from. Take a moment, point to where you feel it. That's right. I'd like you to notice that there's a color, maybe even a series of colors connected to those amazing feelings. What color of colors would that be for you, first and primary? Now, take your hand, take your dominant hand, touch that spot where you feel it. Now, if there were a picture floating in the space around you that represents that amazing feeling, a picture that you could reach out and touch, first impression, where would you reach out and touch it? Okay, excellent. Now, trace, take, trace the outline of that picture with both of your hands so you know how big it is. Now, grab it. Just like you would expand the window on your iPhone or your touchscreen, expand the picture. Try not to slug the person next to you. Notice what happens to the feelings in your body. They get stronger, they get weaker. First impression. That's right. Now bring it back to its original size. Keep the size of the picture exactly the same now, but this time, slowly pull it closer to your body and notice what happens to it. Does the feeling get stronger or does it get weaker? Excellent. Lift it up over your head. Pull it down around you like a big blanket. That's right. What happened to the feeling now? Excellent. Increase. Excellent. Now, you can have this feeling back in whatever intensity level you want in just a moment, but for the sake of our drill, I want you to unwrap that feeling, lift it back up over your head. As you hold this feeling above your head, I want you to remember something. Inside your mind, body, and soul, you, you are the god or goddess of your reality. You're the king or queen of your universe. You have every right, privilege, and authority to make any change that you want for any reason that you want. I want you to play with your power right now. I want you to make that picture bigger, make it smaller, move it up, move it down, move it in your body, move it outside of your body. Notice how every time you change the size, shape, and location of that picture, the feelings and the intensity of those feelings change as well. And I want you to keep playing with it until you find the exact size, shape, and location that gives you the exact feeling that you want to have at the exact intensity level that you want to have it. When you find that sweet spot, I want you to fix it into place. Notice how the feelings in your body shift and change as the energy flows from the picture to your body, from your body to your heart, from your heart to your bloodstream. Every place your blood flows, those feelings go into every nerve and every cell and every atom, into the very DNA of those cells, transforming, reprogramming, turning each and every cell of your body into a powerful, perpetual pleasure factory. Each cell of your body generating more and more and more of those amazing feelings in an infinite, ever-expanding, unlimited supply. There's no need to measure it, manage it, or make it happen faster. Just notice the process taking place. Allow it to install itself completely. And when you know it's done, it's locked in, test it. Try to turn that wonderful feeling off. Notice what happens instead. When you're satisfied. Stop testing, open your eyes, notice how good you feel. That's right. How y'all doing? <laughs> Fabulous, right? Great. Give yourselves a round of applause. Have a seat. All right. For some of you, these drills are review, but I don't want you to think of them as review. I want you to think of them as basic training. These are neuroplasticity drills. These are the drills that will allow you, if you play with them, play with them, give you 
increased ability to change anything you want to anything you want. Now, the one thing we didn't do was move it and throw it behind us. I just forgot. <laughs> I just forgot, right? But I will tell you that behind it, if you want to get rid of stuff, behind you is where you put it. Okay? Just for fun, stand up. All right, we'll do something a little different this time. Well, actually, go ahead and bring up that, uh, you know, grab that picture that was in your sweet spot. Grab a hold of it, lift it up over your head. Okay. Make sure you got the right one. Squeeze it like a little bit like an accordion. Notice what happens to the feeling. Does it get stronger or weaker? Excellent. Now imagine it's a Frisbee. Throw it all the way behind you until it disappears behind the horizon. So does this gone? Scan your body. Notice what happened to the feeling. As soon as you don't, as soon as you realize you want that feeling back, lift your hands up. Now you imagine now that your hands are the world's most powerful frisbee magnets. Suck that frisbee right back into your hand, and just like before, play with it. Make it bigger, make it smaller, move it up, move it down, move it in your body, move it out until you find a location that makes it even better. Fix it into place. Notice how the feelings in your body shift and change with every breath you take and every beat of your heart. That energy flows from the picture to your body, from your body to your heart, from your heart to your bloodstream. Every place your blood flows, those feelings go. Into every nerve, into every cell, into every atom, into the very DNA of those cells. Transforming, reprogramming, turning each and every cell of your body into a powerful, perpetual pleasure factory. Each cell of your body generating more and more and more of those amazing feelings in an infinite, ever-expanding, and unlimited supply. There's no need to measure it, manage it, or make it happen faster. Just notice the process taking place. Allow it to install itself completely. And when you know it's done, test it. Try to bring the old feelings back. Try to turn the new feelings off and notice what happens instead. When you're done, stop testing. Open your eyes. Look up here. Notice how good you feel. You can't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is the worst you'll ever be. These are not just parlor tricks. These are drills. Give you guys a round of applause. Have a seat. You guys are good. Right? I'm put, I'm just drilling you. I'm just gonna keep hammering you guys. Right? Why? Because that's how you get good. Here's the secret. I can always tell who's gonna get the greatest degree of change. Because I say reach out and touch it, and they go. I can always tell who's gonna have a little bit of challenge. I say reach out and touch, they go. Right, get your meat involved. There's a reason we we always start the trainings with hooked on a feeling. The fastest way to change anything in your body is to change your body feelings. Fastest way to change your body feelings is to change your physiology. Get back into the meat. Most of us have been conditioned to be talking heads. We're dead from the neck down. We're no longer conscious of the wealth of information that's locked in our bodies. But it's there and it's waiting if you're willing to play. Right? You have to decide if you want it that, that much. Okay? I can teach you these things. I can walk you through them, but I can't do it for you. I can install a lot of shit, which I am. Right? Um, so let's see. So we've got... Physiology controls psychology. Everything human beings do is in response to a feeling. We have a positive and negative weighting system of the autonomic nervous system. We've covered the fact that your nervous system, you're not the way you are because of the things that happened to you. You're the way you are because of the way you recorded the things that happened to you and the way you've been relating to those recordings. Best part about that is you're in charge of the editing deck. Your memories aren't real. They're re reconstructions of something that happened to you once and you've been relating to the recording of it ever since but the way you recorded it is determining how it affects you but you have permission to change it in fact that's one of the prime directives remember i talked that there was this little system that the universe built into each of us when we were, have those moments of trauma those moments of violation those moments when we're overwhelmed how many people have ever seen the movie ghostbusters either the new one or the old one right so you know when there's a when there's a ghost running rampant the first thing to do is slide a trap under it Suck the, suck the ghost right in the trap, and then they take the trap and they put it in another container. 
right? Well, that's exactly what your neurology does with traumas. Whether they're, whether they're complex traumas or primary traumas. In that moment of overwhelm, your neurology literally opens up, grabs the feelings and the memories and the emotions, locks it in a little box, takes that little box and sticks it in your body. So places where you have a lot of tension, where you have knots, where you have uh, blood stagnation if from a Chinese medical perspective. For those of you who don't know, I am a doctor in oriental medicine. Um, and I have I had a practice in Solana Beach almost going on 20 years now. Um, I'll just give you my pedigree for those of you who don't know. Uh, for the last four years, I've been hailed as the number one NLP trainer with the number one NLP course in the world. So I know a little bit about this shit. Um, but you don't have to believe it. It doesn't matter because if you don't get a result, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, that's why you're here. Okay, so one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to start to play with the things that we've gotten that we've played with so far. That there's a coding system. Point to where you feel it, reach out and touch it. This connects your interoceptive nervous system to your proprioceptive nervous system, the inside to the outside. You ever notice that when people talk about their shit, they always use their hands. And they always say things like, I got this thing, if I could just get past it. Watch the hand. You'll notice when they talk about their shit, the hand goes to a consistent place. People are always gesturing external to themselves where the information they're accessing is stored internally. So one of the things we want to do is we want to use the hands and the eyes to create multiple on-ramps to that information. That's why when you do this and you start playing with it, all these little on-ramps come out of nowhere and create more juice going to that part of your brain. So the eyes and the hands take up the most surface area in your brain than any other part of you. Your neurology doesn't make a distinction between something that is this real or this real. It's all the same as far as the neurology is concerned. Embedded within that vibrational structure is information in the form of qualities that function like a computer code. For example, what happened when you made the picture bigger? What happened to the feelings in your body when you made the picture bigger? Some of you got, some of you had expanded. How many did got the opposite? You made it bigger and it got less. Oh, so you're all expanders. Okay, size queens. All right, I get it. Right? A small percentage of people, when you make the picture bigger, the, the feeling will get less intense. We call them concentrators. It doesn't matter which one you are. Just know which one you are. If you make the picture bigger and the intensity goes down, do the opposite because that's how you play with the system. The more you play with these commands or these qualities, it's like turning the volume knob up and down on your stereo. Turn it, make it up, volume goes up, intensity level goes up, make it closer, intensity level goes up, make it go away, volume goes down. For people who suffer from chronic anxiety, panic attacks, phobias, and other forms of PTSD, if you ask them to actually point to where they feel it and touch the picture, the pictures are almost always right here and they're this fucking big. If you just have them point and touch and push it away, you'll see them visibly calm down. I've, worked, I've done this with people with Asperger's. I've done, if I have people on the autistic spectrum who can follow the instructions, it works for them too. Sometimes they're a little too literal, so you just have to, you have to finagle the languaging a little bit, but it's the same. The only difference really that I've seen uh, in terms of, um, and I don't, I don't want to talk too much about it, but with Asperger's and, and some of those, is the default settings. The default settings on the nervous system are just turned all the way up. You guys ever, you guys are probably too young to remember when like there was these things called stereos, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I had... The stereo, I've seen this with dimmer switch too. You know how sometimes you have a dimmer switch and you set it and then you walk away and it just starts to creep up? You ever have a dimmer switch like that or I had an equalizer? I had a stereo equalizer like that. I had to constantly be setting it. That's kind of what happens with people who are in the autistic or Asperger's spectrum is their default settings are way high. Well, if we understand that and we teach them this mechanism, they can start to develop a dimmer switch that even when it starts to creep up, they can put it back down. The hardest part is getting them to, to understand that, right? But 
the, the few people I've worked with, and I've worked with some really like, like you remember um, Clarence, right? There's a lot of beliefs that people who are on the autistic spectrum aren't good hypnotic subjects. Oh, nay, nay. Oh, nay, nay. <laughs> right? A lot of it is how you communicate with them. And that's the secret. Just, you know, simple, clear instructions. All right. Um, here's what I'd like us to do. I'd like us to take a, a, a short break. I want you to eat as much chocolate. And there's coffee in the lobby. I want you to eat, drink as much coffee and chocolate as humanly possible. When we come back from our break, we're going to start clearing up shit. We're going to show you two of the most powerful, on top of everything else, I'm going to show you some of the most, two of the most powerful procrastination blasting tools I've ever found. Actually, three. And we're just going to, we're just going to break up and we're just going to drill them. We're, maybe we'll do small group work. Maybe we'll do it as, as, a, as, a, as a big group. I'm not sure exactly what form that's going to take, but we're going to start building on the foundations that we've laid. Has this been useful? You guys find some things you can use from this. The secret to what you learned in part one of tonight's training is you got to use them. You got to play with it. Do it for five, 10 minutes every day before you go to bed. Do it when you get up in the morning, especially when you get up in the morning. Like right when you get up, like a lot of times I don't even get out of bed. I just start playing with pictures. The reason for that is one of the times in your, the two times in your, in your day when you are the most flexible and, and, uh, Translagogic is when you're going to sleep at night and when you're waking up in the morning. So if you really want to leverage those naturally occurring trance states, that's your window. The thing about going to sleep at night doing this stuff is your unconscious mind will actually grab onto the things you are working on as you fall into sleep and continue to do them throughout the night. It's very good. You're going to have some really wicked dreams, though. You'll probably have wicked dreams tonight. It's okay. It's, it's you processing, right? And by the way, it doesn't actually matter if what you're working with is an emotional pain or a physical one. As far as your nervous system is concerned, it's all data. I don't care if it's a back pain or a broken heart. The system runs all the data the same way. Right? I have doctors here in San Diego work in the critical care unit and they use our spinning and our magic frame and our color breathing techniques on anything that comes in from broken knees to kidney stones because it's faster than drugs okay you don't got to believe it that's the best part you just got to play with it right and if you play you will evolve so for those of you who came out tonight because i always give the best stuff to the people with butts in the chairs sorry i love you youtubers but hey they're here right um normally to walk into my door um, it's 375 an hour. And that's an hourly rate based on the amount of time that we spend with you. I'd like to give you all a free gift tonight. I'd like to give you my friend Moss. <laughs> and what I mean by that is Moss is kind of my uh my my most closest protege of all the wonderful students that I have. He actually picked his ass up and moved from Manhattan to San Diego um, to be here. So I'm gonna Moss, I I, I trust him completely. And for those of you who want our help, I'd like to offer each and every one of you a free 30 minute consultation. And that's to see if this is actually a fit for what you have. After you pass your 30 minute consultation, we'll discuss strategies and tactics for helping you get your situations resolved in the shortest amount of time possible. If all you wanna do is pick our brains for 30 minutes, that's fine. If you want help, we'll run you through a few drills to see if, if, if you're ready for that. And then we'll show you know the, op the options that are available. If we can help you, we'll tell you. If we can't help you, we'll tell you that too. And we, but we, what we will do is we will point you in the direction of where we believe the help you need is most accessible. It might be Brent Baum. It might be a book. It might be another practitioner who does like EMDR or something that we think might be a better fit. Because our job is to help you. Regardless of what, what level of interactiveness you're comfortable with. If we can help you, we will. That's our job, right? I just wanted to, I, I started these things many, many years ago because I was, I was lonely. <laughs> I, I came to San Diego with all this cool stuff I wanted to do and nobody to do it with. Like a lot of people, a lot of people start meetups and put butts in seats to, to build a business. That was never, ever my intention when I started this stuff. 
I came to San Diego. I knew no one. He'll tell you. I, I used to run practice groups for years up in LA for fun. We never had a training to promote. We were never trying to put butts in seats. I taught this shit for free for 10 years. When I came to San Diego, I had all this cool stuff I wanted to do and nobody to do it with. So I said, well, I got to find cool people who like to do cool stuff. Anybody here cool? Anybody here like to do cool stuff? Anybody like to hang out with cool people who like to do cool stuff? There we go. See? All right, then you're in the right place. Right? All my meetups are like that. We, it's never about the whole the whole client thing. And we had a we wound up, we wound up with a waiting list six months long. But getting in to see us was like literally seeing a lottery. It was insane. I'll, I'll tell you about that another time. But we only have a few slots for that because he's filling up like crazy. But we got a few of his clients in here right now. But um, if you're interested, there's a free 30-minute session. If you want to pick his brain, if, if it's something that he thinks I need to be in on, he'll call me and I'll show up, right? So it's completely free. Um, but see him during the break. Grab some coffee. Grab lots of chocolate. And we're going to start with uh, what we call bucket listing. We're going to go into cleaning up negative emotions. And then we're going to finish with the, uh, two of the most, three of the most powerful procrastination techniques that I know for reprogramming your conscious mind. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah. All right. 15 minutes, go. So Kieran's asking, how can we leverage the free consultation? Call 858-282-4663. Speak to Moss. in your tissues right and as you as you start to change state you start to change the frequency in your body and your body will start to want to purge the things that aren't in resonance with that new state so don't be surprised if you start really holding it that you start shit just starts coming up and that's exactly what's supposed to happen because in every in every advanced qigong system or metaphysics systems um, that's based on ascension training right the, the first year or two years is nothing but pure as purging and purification. It's just triggering the body to release all your shit. The way they do that is by putting certain stresses on the physical body, certain breathing patterns and certain poses. And then the longer you hold it, the more those things start to bubble up. So if that, if those things start to happen, you're not doing something wrong. You're actually doing something right. You get, the secret is to keep going. You'll notice also when you start doing the, the two minute one, You'll notice that right about the minute 30, 
then you, you, you want to quit. You start like, oh, it's taking too long. That's your body trying to stay the same because it knows it's, it, it, the, the, the pressure is going up and it's about, to, it's about to trigger a state change and your body doesn't like to change. It likes to stay wherever it's at. Right until a new normal is established, right? Because of the inherent gravity of negativity, it's always pulling us down. Oh, yeah, for sure. Similar? Yeah. Yeah. But what do you do when you're building up that energy? Are you just in your own head? Or are you like, is your body starting to get involved? Right. Yeah. Right. The minute you, you access again, it's a feedback loop. When you talk about feedback loop, remember, you have the mind, you have the body. So anything I trigger with my body will affect my mind. But also anything I do with my mind will eventually trigger something in my body. The problem is, is that for most people, the environment and the people you're surrounded by overwhelm your cognition. It overwhelms your willpower. And your physiology slumps, and now you not only are fighting the environment, you're fighting your own physiology, which is why you can't stay positive. But if you understand physiology and you can summon up just enough willpower to hold that posture, then the state can engage and you're no longer fighting yourself. Right? The mu well, music is a very strong anchoring device. So I use music a lot, obviously, right? We started our, our meetup with music, right? It's one of the most culturally useful things that we have. But we have to, but we remember that those scenes, those, those, those things are transient. So I have to be keep being re-triggered, right? right? Yes. Black blood. Stagnant blood, yeah. Yeah, the way it works, you guys can have, you're in the way of the camera. Um, so the way it works in Chinese medicine, uh, the way it works in Chinese medicine is they'll, they'll tell you that qi stagnation leads to blood stagnation. Blood stagnation leads to pretty much every, every kind of lesion that happens in the body. Tumor, lipomas, phlegm, both substantial phlegm and insubstantial phlegm. All emotions are energetic patterns. But... It's an energetic field imprinted with a story and a meaning. That's all energy is for us. It's a, it's a rewritable DVD. But it's encoded in a language that the, the autonomic nervous system is uniquely designed to interpret. Right? I, I don't think you guys, you guys may not have seen this before, but. This is how your this is what your thoughts are made of. If you look at this, all right, the red indicates the vibrational field or the, the DVD. Imprinted in now, you know when you, you if you were to actually look at a DVD, you wouldn't see the movie. You understand that? You would see what? Ones and zeros or electromagnetic or optic ones and zeros. But those those ones and zeros mean something. They form computer commands or co codes that the reader understands and can play a movie. Well, you have five primary channels, just like you have an audio channel and a video channel. And sometimes if you add, you're adding transitions or you're adding call outs, there's an, yet another channel. You can keep adding channels and just layer things over. You had it first. But you have these five primary channels within each of these channels are little distinctions. So for example, in the visual system, you have moving versus still, color versus black and white, fuzzy versus clear, associated versus dissociated. Now, though, there's a lot more than this, but these are examples. This is what, what one of NLP's big con contributions to this whole system was that these sub-modalities, this NLP would call this a modality, and these little distinctions in that channel, they would call it a sub-modality. But here's the thing, they're not sub to anything. The term submodalities implies that they're less powerful, but they're actually more powerful. It's the submodalities that determine what your neurology does with the data. 
Very simple. Size and proximity are two submodalities. The moment you made that picture bigger, what happened to the feeling? What happened to the, got stronger? Did I tell you to make it stronger? No, you just changed the code and the, the effect happened, right? So there's no hypnosis there in the terms of like suggesting for it. What happened when you brought the picture closer? You got stronger. What happened when you wrapped it around you? Now you're in it. You've gone from what we call dissociated to associated. Now it's, you're embodying it. It's like you've gone from a, third, a, a first or a second person or third person video game into a first person shooter, right? I, did I tell you to do that? No. The code told your neurology, play it this way. And so it did. Now you put all those things together along with the story and you have the movie. That's, we call that content, right? So you have the energy, the structure, and the meaning. The meaning and the story of what happened. It's the story that keeps all this in place. The minute I change the story, I change all this. And the system just says, oh, I can fix that. You know, Where's the microphone for Jose? Pass it. So for like stroke victims, do you think um, those bad feelings kind of caused it? Caused it? Yeah, caused it or? <laughs> it's highly possible that some deep emotional stuff created the situation that led to the stroke. Now, is it possible if someone had suffered from a stroke to do these exercises that we just did and start to change their brain? 100%. Mr. Richard here, why don't you come up and tell him your little story? Please welcome Mr. Richard, Mr. Hypnosis Rumble to the stage. How are you all doing? All right, so I have a couple of stroke stories. Uh, for some reason, it just happens that way. Uh, my my wife's uh, grandmother had a stroke, and she was unresponsive to anybody in the home, and she was just kind of laying there in the bed, it wouldn't respond to anybody. Nobody could get her to to flutter her eyes or to move her hand. She was just a vegetative state, and we had just started doing the uh, the sleepwalkers practice sessions, and we were getting together. We were talking about hypnotic language patterns, all the stuff that the CPI and the renegade reframe which by the way, it's in February Yes. Uh, and the renegade reframe language patterns. And so I sat in there with her and I chatted with her a little bit. I used some hypnotic language patterns and I talked to her a little bit about rewiring her circuitry. So I, I don't know if any of you know uh, Ruth Buzzy from mm -hmm. the old laughing and she is an old telephone operator. Well, there's a little old lady. She knows what a telephone operator was because she had done that job when she was younger, right? And you'd have to Take this line, you unplug it from here, and you plug it in down to there. And if that connection wasn't working, you could take it and you could plug another one into another spot, and you could totally rewire the way that your signal went from point A to point B in the context of a telephone. And I used those kinds of stories, talking to her, allowing her to assume that she could do that with her brain. And by the time we finished the conversation, she was moving her eyes, she was squeezing my hand, Nobody else said it gotten any kind of response at all. Okay. So that's just with, with one sitting down, chit chatting with her and using some language patterns and some analogies and some stories. Right. Um, uh, later on, uh, her, Sandy's mother or the other lady's daughter also had a stroke and we used the same kinds of language patterns and uh, she recovered from the stroke mentally. 100% fully from the stroke, but she didn't want to do any of the physical PT exercises, right? And you kind of have to do the physical as well as the mental. And so because she didn't do the physical, her body atrophied, but she was still mentally cognizant and super aware for the next 10 years. Not bad. So these language patterns, they work on the brain you'd have to still do some physical work with the with the body to get the the muscles moving and everything 
engage the body. If she would have done her PT, she could have lived her life normally, not in a hospital bed, right? So, you know, some, some crazy stuff happens when we use this stuff and, and we just, we just use it with everybody that we come across all the time. Thank you, sir. Give a big round of applause, Mr. Rumble. All right. Uh, we got about two minutes. Let me see if there's any questions from our YouTubers that I can answer. Or do you guys have any other questions? Yes. Hold on. Give her a microphone. There's microphones from everywhere now. What is the difference between uh, reframe and the language pattern? Okay. Reframing is also a type of language pattern, but it doesn't necessarily, it, it, it's about it, the, the reframe patterns change perspective. In other words, when you when you apply a, a reframe pattern to somebody's belief or uh, objection, it causes them to think about it differently. And in that process of changing its perspective and thinking about it differently, they can't go back to thinking about it the old way. It literally, like, if there's a if there's a one, two, three, four, five, six sequence of thought in them, and you hit them with a replay with a reframe, it goes one, two, boom. and like in that moment where you interrupt that pattern they become super hyper suggestible. And then when you hit them with the rest of the reframe pattern, they accept that new belief or they accept that new perspective and the way they're thinking about it changes, right? Now different, there's about 14 basic patterns that can be used to be pretty much change any belief, overcome any objection or win any argument, right? Um, my favorite one is what we call a redefine, right? And there's two ways that you can use that. You can beat people over the head with it or you can be very inquisitive and, and soft with it, which is my favorite way to do it. It would be more, that'd be more of the Jesus of Nazareth approach as opposed to like the Richard Bandler beat them over the head until they can't fight back cognitively anymore, right? Both work. And sometimes it's more appropriate to be the baseball bat than the, you know, the feather duster, right? But a reframe pattern will cause somebody to think about things from a different perspective. The other language patterns, the specific ones that we mentioned will cause a specific process of thought that is predictable in the mind. In other words, if I talk about the awareness presupposition, notice how the feelings in your body shift and change. You don't get a choice. Right? If I say things like try to argue with that and notice what happens instead, you don't get a choice. Right? Why? Because the dynamic, the, the effect the language pattern has. When you, especially like the word instead. Instead is one of the most powerful sleeper words in the English language because of what it does to the mind. When you hear the word instead, it allows for any other possibility except the original one. Think about that for a moment. A person has a problem, you ask them, try to bring it back and notice what happens instead, and now something else happens. And so the full spectrum of, of potential is there. Awareness causes, awareness verbs cause people, it causes a separation, actually. One of the things it does is it causes a separation of the conscious mind, critical faculty of the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. And it causes the unconscious mind to just start running the program while the conscious mind watches, whether the conscious mind wants to do it or not. That's what makes it the most powerful language pattern that exists because that function happens even when the person knows it's being done and they're actively trying to resist it, okay? You start putting these things together in different combinations and now your words start to become really, really powerful. If you start adding energetics to it, voice and sound training like we do with the mega retreats, stuff like that, now you're not only affecting them cognitively, but you're actually affecting them at the organ level and the, and the, the meridian level. And that's what medical Qigong training was really all about, was using sound, light, vibration, electricity, and magnetism to change the body. But part of it is sound projection. That's the stuff I hold back and I keep secret for the, the mega retreats because literally we have people who can vibrate the alcohol out of wine and whiskey and shit. It's, it's crazy, right? But they get this massive contact high and I can't control them for the next 45 minutes afterward because they're stoned, right? Questions about, did I answer your question? Right. Reframing is extremely powerful. Right. You can reframe a behavior. You can reframe a context. You can reframe um, the meaning. 
cause any anything really, right? And that's why we devoted a whole training to it, which is coming up in February, right? For those of you who want to learn how to do that, and it's really powerful when you apply it to yourself. Think about this for a moment. What if for every limiting belief that you had, and even some you didn't know you had, you had 14 ways to change it in seconds. That's what, that's what it does when you apply it to self. We had one guy, DJ, he came to our, our coach. We have, a, we have a, day, a weekly coaching program that we run. And we were doing reframing patterns. And I had everybody write down all their limiting beliefs. And I taught him like four or five of these patterns. I said, now use these patterns on your limiting beliefs. He couldn't go back to thinking about any of it the same way. It was like, and he did it to himself, right? So we'll talk about some of those things, right? My favorite one is called a redefine. Not X, it's Y, right? So give me a, a limiting belief that you might have. Hold on, let's get, a, let's get a microphone. I'll just give one quick example. Um. You're all out of limiting beliefs? <laughs> okay, no more sessions for you. <laughs> I can't close. Well, it's not that you can't close. It's just haven't, you have, just haven't found the right sequence of events to do to, to make sure it's 100%. I can't close everybody I talk to. Well, it's not that you can't close everybody you've talked to. It's just you haven't talked to everybody yet. I can't close every I, I've talked to or the ones that are still yet to talk to. But which is more important? You're focusing on the people you can't close or focusing on the people you can? The ones that I can. Excellent. Thinking about it like that, wouldn't it be better just get rid of that? <laughs> <laughs> that was two patterns, right? And that, the other one was also one of my favorites called hierarchy of criteria. What just happened? Talk to talk into the microphone. That was amazing. <laughs> he was trying hard too. <laughs> I was. <laughs> well, it's not that you were trying really hard. It's just you thought you were trying hard until you realized you were out class. I never realized that that was the point. <laughs> That's right. He didn't even know he got. He didn't know he got blasted. It's like, oh yeah, <laughs> and that's what you'll see, right? You'll say, oh yeah. You ever see people just suddenly realize something? That's how you know it landed. They're like. <laughs> let's, just get, let's just get that look, right? You can do this to yourself, right? Make a list. Again, I'm going to show you what we call bucket listing now. Make a list of every belief that holds you back in any way, shape, or form and apply these, you know, some of these patterns to it and it'll change just spontaneously, right? Um, so we got a lot to do in a very short time. So I hope you guys are ready. I hope you're eating lots of candy because I also do weight loss. And then we're going to do, um, I think you're going to like the procrastination blaster. So the first thing we're going to talk about is bucket listing. Now, the reason we have to talk about bucket listing is because of the thing we talked about at the beginning of the class, which is the inherent negativity bias of the human nervous system. Your nervous system is designed to force you to pay attention to the Godzilla level shit in your neurology above the Bambi level shit, right? Understand that. Your neuro Remember we said your neurology sorts for what's familiar? All right, so what happens is you have this big honking problem that you wanna fix and you don't know how to fix it. So you go running off to YouTube or you go running off to Amazon or whatever, you know, audible books or whatever to find somebody who has a solution. And so what's literally happening is here's you, here's the book, Here's Godzilla. It doesn't end well. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you, right? Right? That's why we fail. Because you're taking something you have absolutely no confidence, experience, or history of success with and fighting the thing you've got the most practice doing. If you want to work on yourself, you have to train differently. You have to flip the script. How many people have ever played a video game? Okay. How many are old like me and remember the game Dungeons and Dragons? It's okay. You can admit to geekness. Not you, huh? All right, fine. 
Fine, just fine. We'll, we'll stick to the video game metaphor then. So you guys have all seen where you, you have this level one character, right? You have your brand new sword or your little magic wand, right? And you're fine as long as you stay in the level one zone. But every now and then you see a level one character wander into a level 10 or 20 killing area. What happens? It doesn't end well for the level one character, does it? Why? The monster's too big and the character's too weak. You, not enough experience points, but there's this thing. If the, if the level one character stays in the level one area long enough, every time they kill a monster, they get experience points and they level up. So before you know it, that level one character becomes a level two. Level two becomes a level three. And soon that can launder into the level five areas. And now they can deal level five, six, and seven monsters. Why? Because they're within range. Yes? That's what you need to do to work on your own shit. Now, if somebody's guiding you, now we can take on Godzilla. But if you're doing this on your own, you got to flip the script. So how do we do that? This is called bucket listing. Okay. You knew it was coming. Bucket listing. First thing you do is a brain dump. What does that mean? You take everything that bothers you that you want to change and just vomit it onto a piece of paper. Right? So we'll just I'll just do little lines here, right? So there's two ways that we can do this. We can do this in the brain dump format, which is ugly. Or we can do thematic bucket listing. Okay, what does that mean? When I'm doing a thematic bucket list, what I want to do, I want to vomit everything onto the page. Like I'm going to pick a topic like fear. And I'm just going to write everything on my page that I'm afraid of, which is what most procrastination is like. Some form of fear. Okay, that fear can, uh, that, that procrastination can take a couple of different forms. But the end result is you don't get around to doing the shit you know you need to do, right? So because fear tends to be one of the big ones, maybe we do that. So what do I do? I vomit onto my page everything I'm afraid of. So maybe it's spiders, paperwork, cold calling, um, dealing with people. <laughs> All right. Um, maybe it's um, the unknown? Okay. All right. So now I've got four or five things. Now what I got to do is I got to assign a number value on a scale of one to 10. How intense is my fear of spiders? Maybe it's a four. How intense is my fear of paperwork? Maybe it's a 12. I really hate paperwork, right? Cold calling. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a 10. Some people, right? Uh, dealing with people, maybe it's a nine. The unknown, maybe it's a six, right? Then what do I want to do? I want to rearrange the list. So I got my four, I got my six, I got my nine, I got my 10, I got my 12. Well, we'll just assume it's all, it's all 10, because right? But the idea here now is I want to start adding more entries for each of these intensity levels, usually around three to five. Now, obviously, it'd be best if we could do one, two, three, four, all the way down. But a lot of a lot of times, it won't be that way. But you can start to extrapolate what might be a three, what might be a seven. You follow me so far, Andy? Okay. Why do we want to do it this way? Because when I start working with my technique, I want to do all my level ones first. When I've knocked out all my level ones with the technique I want to develop, now I go to my level twos. When I've knocked out all my level twos, using my technique, I go to my level threes, my level fours. By the time you hit fives and sixes, you're going to build up such an intense history of success with that technique. Your neurology is going to say, oh, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. And you can work right up the scale until you're doing the eights, nines, and tens. The process will start to automate, 
And through the entire training sequence, the perceived level of difficulty is only one. How, how, much, how big a space is it between one and two? How big a space between eight and nine? Exactly. It's a different way to train. Now, here's the best part. Just the very act of creating the list will cause you to process this. Just the act of vomiting it onto a page and reorganizing it by intensity level will put you meta to the experiences, which takes you out of it and gives you control over it. Right? You, don't, you don't even know what all those words mean, but let's just tell you, it takes you from associated to dissociate it. Now you have power over it. Just the act of creating a list will do that. You'll start to process it right away. Someone had a question. Namisha, do you have a question? Well, in my example, I was listing, the, I started with a four and then I went six, eight, nine. Ideally, what I'd like to do, so the question was, why am I doing the one, two, threes? When I teach this in my classes, we have you pick ones and twos and threes and then organize it and then fill in more examples at each intensity level. The reason for that is, is that sometimes one or two isn't enough to build up a, a solid history and rep repetition. But what will happen, I have one, I have guys now who are telling me like they just point to something, like they, they want to get rid of something, they go to point to it, it's gone. Because there's a process in NLP when we talk about anchors called streamlining. If you have four or five things that you anchor, one, two, three, four, like it's called chaining anchors, the nervous system gets better and better and better at that sequence. And so what happens instead of going, you hit here and then it goes, this one fires, then this one fires, then this one fires, then this one fires. What actually happens when you start to streamline is you fire this and this fires. It just And so what's happening now with some of our students is they've done this bucket listing process with all the different techniques so many times that the minute they become aware of feeling and go to point to it, their nervous system just nukes it. It's a byproduct of the training. You have to, the only way you get there is by actually doing the technique enough time. Now, the people who are really doing this are also seeing clients. And so not only are they getting it from themselves, they're doing this with other people. So the secret to really getting good is being on both ends not just receiving it, but also walking other people through it. Does that make sense? But this is how you apply everything that you've, you're gonna, you've learned so far and what you're gonna be learning until the end of tonight. You have to follow, start with the low level shit first. Because if you go after Godzilla, Godzilla will show up, right? And trust me, every time I bring somebody up, up here, to, I say, give me a one or two or three, they always pick Godzilla. I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to be in a room with David again. I've got to get Godzilla out of me. Yes. The times that I was trying to do some technique to heal something, and uh, I knew what I want to get healed. But when I start to when I'm, when I'm going to start the process of the healing, so I want to think about what I want to get rid of, I just couldn't think of that. I just could think the the result. Mm -hmm. So so you, you, you couldn't think of what you wanted to get rid of, you just wanted a result. Okay, I, for instance, I want to get rid of a fear of a spider, for instance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm, that's what I want. So when I'm going to start the process, I could not think of, I want to get rid, uh, rid of the uh, fear of a spider. I just could uh, think of the memory. In my mind, I just could see the end result. I don't have fear anymore. Okay. So what does it mean? I got killed already without... Well, when you look at a spider, what happens? Oh, no, I don't have fear of a spider. No, no. I just get that no, if if... Again, a lot of times what happens is like using the spider example, which I actually had a lady two meetups ago. We were, I was talking about spiders. Spider was coming down. She freaked out. She freaked out right where you were sitting, Namisha. And I literally walked up to her and I just zapped the spider phobia right out. I got it on tape or video. We don't have tape anymore. Right. I sent the spider his royalty check. 
perhaps that one, right? But a lot of times, if it's like you go to clear something and all of a sudden, the, the, when you go to provoke it, it's not there, you're done. Yeah. Some people just don't know who to be if they let it go. That freaks them out more. It sounds weird. It sounds like, why would anybody be that way? Because we sort for what's familiar. Remember what he said, fear of the unknown? Who will I be without this? That is a huge thing, especially when we talk about procrastination. If I actually accomplish this, mine will be different. What if I don't like it? What if it's bad? What if people don't like me? Sounds familiar? Okay. There's two kinds of beliefs that we have, folks. There's beliefs that we know about and beliefs we don't. And we don't know what those other beliefs are until some dude in a vest or a spider comes along and provokes the shit out of you. Understand? So the other thing I want to I caution you about is thinking you'll ever be done. You have, if the science is true, you have millions of years of accumulated genetic memory floating around inside of you. If you go looking for shit to fix, I promise you will find it. And that can be, and you'll have the tools to do it. But I promise you that that can itself can become a problem where you become so focused on fixing your shit, you don't move forward. Because a lot of people believe, oh, once I'm fixed all my shit, I can be move forward and be successful. Well, if you're never done, you can never move forward. So you can't be successful, which also keeps you stuck. So here's the algorithm I want you to apply to this. Move forward. When you run into something that stops you or slows you down, fix it. Keep moving forward. Don't go looking for more shit. Let the life you lead provoke the shit you need to deal with. Because if it's not holding you back, it's not a fucking problem. When it starts to hold you back or impede your progress, that's when you fix it. That's if you want to self-actualize, right? If you want to be one of these people that hides in a cave contemplating their navel until they ascend in a puff of white glory or not so white glory, I don't know what the fuck color it is, right? But you can do that too. There's, there's a place for that if that's, if that's part of your spiritual journey. My biggest pet peeve with most of these systems is that they're all here. They're all trying to leave. They all want to go back to heaven. Well, we came here for a reason. Let's, let's have fun, right? All right. So this is bucket listing. This is something I want you guys to just take a, a couple minutes. Do you have paper? All right. Let's just take two or three minutes and write down three to five things maybe as they pertain to procrastination, maybe as they pertain to other shit that's holding you back, could be, and, I, and again, you can do a brain dump where you just randomly vomit out things onto the sheet that you want to fix, or you can do it thematically, like all the things I'm afraid of, all the things that make me sad, all the things that make me angry. Either way is fine, but whatever you do, we're, we're going to keep it short because again, we don't have a lot of time and I want to make sure you guys have enough chances to get your reps in. So this is, I want, but I want us to be able to, to isolate the small ones and focus on those. Okay. You guys feel free, you guys at home, feel free to do this too if it's something that you, you think is useful. Oh, shit. I don't have much time, do I? Okay. All right. I know what we'll do. Okay, time's up. I know. I, I'm just going to go ahead. I'll let you guys go.
We'll have to do these as group exercises instead of just doing, we don't have time for demos. Moss, did we lose uh, the chat? No, it's still here. Okay. That's yeah, possible. Yeah, I'm still moderating it. Okay. How much time we have left? I'm going to be very time conscious now. Oh, for the breakout or for the whole event? No, I don't worry about that. Oh. All right. Well, how many you got in? Sanji, right? Amy, I'm sorry. How many you got? Excellent. Okay. Did you give them a number? Yeah. Once you have them vomited onto the sheet, you got to assign a, a charge value to it. Okay. How many you got? Nine. Woo! You got any ones? Okay, but you have a level one? Yes. Come on up. You okay to play? Yes. Okay, very good. This is Namisha. I remember Namisha in the, in, the, in the first generation of meetup days. Okay, so this is called the magic frame exercise. This, if you look at the, let me just put the chat away really quick. This is your, your get rid of negative emotions forever triage kit. If you understand these three techniques, you could literally open a practice fixing people's shit and make a shit ton of money. They work really fast. They can do them anywhere. You can do them in a car at 70 miles an hour. You can do them over the phone. You can do them over chat. You can do them in a line at Starbucks. We've had people do them at airports. Right? I, I have stories and it's not me doing it. It's people just like you. Okay. So, um, so the thing you want to clear, is it okay to talk about it or no? Yeah. What is it? Uh, I don't like taking orders, so I keep making mistakes. I you don't, don't like taking orders, so you keep making mistakes. Yeah, I like. I know I'm making a mistake. I'm still doing it. Okay. Yeah. So scale of one to ten, how much? How problem? It's a one. It's a one. That's a repetition. It's okay to get rid of it. Any reason why you might want to keep that? Okay, close your eyes. I want you to notice that there's a place in your body where the feeling connected to that experience, and the reasons behind that feeling are stored. Take a moment. Point to where you feel it. Now, excellent. Now, if there were a picture floating in the space around you. That represented that feeling and that, that a picture you could reach out and touch. Where'd you reach out to touch it? Excellent. Trace the outline of it with both of your hands so you know how big it is. Perfect. Now, what I want, let's make sure we got the right one. Grab it, make it a little bigger. Tell me what happens to the feeling. The stronger, weaker. Ew. That can you tell by the icky face you made. Bring it back to its original size. Now, slowly pull it closer to your body. Notice what happens. Okay, put it back. I want you to put a big, <laughs> thick black frame around it. Bigger and thicker and blacker, the better. Right, size queen. All right, I got you. <laughs> I want you to feel along the base of that frame. You're going to notice some dials and knobs and switches like on an old style television. You're probably going to remember that shit, but I find the knob that controls the brightness or the contrast. Physically turn that knob all the way to the right until the image whites out completely. Notice how that makes you feel. Now turn it, when, once you got that, turn it all the way to the left until the image blacks out completely. Notice how that makes you feel. Namisha, which one do you like better? Turn it all the way to the white until the image whites out completely. Now, here's where it gets cool. I want you to take the index finger of your dominant hand and in glowing golden letters on that whited out screen, there are some reasons, some lessons that this experience was trying to share with you, trying to teach you, trying to help you understand. I want you to write those lessons on that whited out screen in glowing golden letters so you can keep all the lessons and let everything else go. Now, some people know exactly what those lessons are consciously and blam, they blast it onto that screen like it's nobody's business. Some people have no conscious idea what those things are, but the part of you that created these feelings, that part always knows. So let that part express itself if it needs to. Let it write in whatever language is appropriate on that whited out screen. Some people draw pictures. Some people draw squiggles. Every now and then you get a little rage monkey. They write, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you across the screen. Some people write with both hands simultaneously, like they're writing Chinese or Hebrew at the same time. However you want to do it, just let that finger write like automatic writing. Put everything on that screen. 
so you can keep all the lessons and let everything else go. The feelings come up, put them on the screen too. Excellent. You know you're done. Reach up, shrink it down to the size of a postage stamp or even smaller. Notice how the feelings in your body shift and change with every breath you take and every beat of your heart. Your unconscious mind floats that frame up over the top of your head, back beyond the horizon until it disappears completely below the horizon. And you know the sound a hammer makes when you're banging on a nail? Feel it nailed back there for all eternity and pop will come back. When you know it's nailed back there for all eternity and pop will come back, test it. Try to bring that old feeling back. Try to turn that new feeling off and notice what happens instead. I can turn, on the new, I turn off the new feeling. Oh, is that a good thing? Give her a big round of applause. Is it really that quick? Yeah. If you understand the dynamics of your autonomic nervous system and how it processes information. Now, the technique you just saw was called the transformational triad. What you saw her using is something we call the proprioceptive grid. Can't spell proprioceptive. How do I spell this shit? Too many septives. Uh, fine. Yeah, I know. Let's see if that works. Oh, wait. There we go. Remember that little frame game we played earlier? There it is. Anything in front of your body is a file your neurology is running. Open, it's active, it's running. It's just like a file open on your desktop. Did you ever notice that some files, when you make them bigger, they hide other files? Guess what happens when you make a picture bigger and it's really close? You can't see what's behind it. So when people can't move past something, guess what they can't move past? When you're procrastinating, a lot of people, if they can't see the end result of something, they won't start. Other people, if they can track if they know they need 10 steps to get somewhere, but they're, they're, they're ordinal in nature and they don't know what the first step is, they do nothing. If they can track, if they know they need 10 steps and they can see all the way up to step five, and then they don't know what to do at step five, they'll stop at step one. Those are all forms of procrastination. Some people build the plane as they're flying it. Like they have no fucking clue how to start, but they just start and they figure it out as they go, right? Some people see where they're at, see the end result and realize who they will be, who they want to be at the end of that process and are terrified of it. So they don't start. Does this resonate with anybody? All of the above? Right. So one of the things that we can begin to do is we can begin to move our pictures around. We can start to organize our desktop because whether you're conscious of this phenomenon or not, it's out there and it's impacting your ability to move forward. Okay. You've all heard me say, I got to get past this. Right. You see this here it says anything that's in front of you is, oh, can you guys see this from the back? Everything in the front is open, active, and running. Anything in the back is over, closed, and complete. So people will say, I got to get past this. Well, if you get past it, where does it end up? If I got to put this behind me, where does it end up? Literally. Get around things. Get over things. Where does it end up? The hint is right there. It's in your language. Your brains are simultaneously hierarchical, literal, metaphorical, you name it. It's doing all of these things at the same time. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you know exactly how someone's thinking about something. Not just what they're thinking, but how. If you pay attention to the structure of their language, which takes training. Yes, Namisha. So, uh, you know, sometimes I think Tim Nathan says, if you got to move forward, in team meetings, sometimes the, I don't know, whoever. We've got to move forward. says, move forward, but people are, you can sense they're still hanging on. Mm -hmm all the stuff that didn't get worked out. Yep. So it would be better to say, let's put all this past stuff mm -hmm. and move forward. You can, if you have strong enough rapport with people, this is something my, my advanced students, all, they can all do this. They can literally walk up to somebody and interact with their own. I can, I can merge my proprioceptive grid with his 
And if I see where his pictures are, I think, well, let's just put that block aside for a minute and think about how we can make this happen. <laughs> He's in trance. <laughs> like you can literally see that. That's one of the more invasive ways that you can influence people. But people are always, when they're communicating, they're always referencing these pictures out in front of them. And a lot of times when they, when they get that blank look on their face, they're actually watching the picture. You get too close, like if someone's running a picture and you get too close a lot of times, they get freaked out because you're standing in their picture and they can't process it, right? This is one of the reasons where our social distancing and things like that come from. Again, it's a whole deep well. If you guys want to learn more, we have we can go to nlppower.com and look at our live events. We're going to have more meetups coming up. Uh, we have a mastermind that meets on the third Saturday of every month. It is a paid program, but you get in a small room with me for like six and a half hours, and we work on whatever you want to work on. So if you're interested in getting involved in that program, see Moss, he'll set you guys up, right? Those of you who keep coming back to the meetups, probably the next level for you. You won't get a certificate from the mastermind. What you will get is the chance to roll up your sleeves and do some work, right? And get actual real world feedback. So you guys got at least a one level one to play with? This means yes, this means no. <laughs> what are you laughing about? All right. So it's really, really simple. Play pretend like when you were a little kid. Think about that thing you want to change. Close your eyes, point to where in your body you feel it, and the reason behind it is stored. Okay? Now, if it means point to where you feel it. <laughs> okay. Point to where you feel it. If there were a picture floating in the space around you that represents that feeling, a picture you could reach out and touch, where would you reach out to touch it? Now, let's make sure we've got the right one. Trace the outline of it with both of your hands so you know how big it is. Grab the edges of it, and just like you would, without slugging the person next to you, just like you would expand the windows on your iPhone, go ahead and open it wide. Notice what happens to the feeling. Does it get stronger? Does it get weaker? I bring it back to its original size. Slowly keep the size of the picture exactly the same. Now slowly pull it closer to your body. Notice what happens to the intensity of the feeling. Does it get stronger? Or does it get weaker? Put it back to its original size, original location. Now, using your imagination, place a big, thick, black, heavy frame around it. Most of you are too young to remember when televisions had real dials and knobs and switches instead of touch screens and remote controls. But I want you to find that base of that frame. You're going to feel some dials and knobs and switches like on an old style television. I want you to find the knob that controls the brightness or the contrast. Turn that knob all the way to the right until the image whites out completely. Notice how that makes you feel. Turn the knob all the way to the left until the image blacks out completely. Notice how that makes you feel. Decide for yourself which one you like better. If there's a different color you want that screen to be, Keep playing with it until you get the color you want. Once you've got that, take the index finger of your dominant hand and in glowing golden letters across that colored screen, there were some lessons, obvious lessons that this experience had to teach you, positive or negative, doesn't matter. I want you to write those lessons on that colored out screen in glowing golden letters or whatever color you want. So you can keep all the lessons and let everything else go. Now, some people know consciously what those lessons were, and so they just blast them on the screen. However, some people have no conscious clue what those lessons might be. But the part of you that created those feelings in the first place, that part always knows. So give that part freedom and permission to express itself. Let that part start to write on that screen all the lessons connected to this experience, all the emotions connected to this experience, positive or negative. So you can keep all the lessons and let everything else go. So it'd be like automatic writing. Just let that finger start going. I and mean, my wife does this. She writes for 40 minutes at a time. It's like she's writing a chapter from War and Peace. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care what feelings and emotions come up. As the feelings come up, put them on the screen. Just keep writing. When you know they're done, reach up. Shrink that frame down to the size of a postage stamp or even smaller. Notice how the feelings in your body shift and change as with every breath you take and every beat of your heart. Your other than conscious mind begins moving that frame up over the top of your head, back beyond the horizon until it disappears completely. 
below the horizon when you know and you know the sound a hammer makes when you're banging on a nail feel it nailed back there for all eternity impossible come back when you know it's nailed back there for all eternity impossible come back test it try to bring it back and notice what happens instead when you're satisfied stop testing scan your body notice how different you feel Open your eyes and look out here when you're ready. Only when you're ready. Some people process faster than others. Now, when we actually start making these changes, some people go through all kinds of interesting transformations. Some people break out in a sweat. Some people laugh. Some people yawn. Some people cry. Some people twitch. Some people just feel waves of emotion coming up. However your body does it, that's just your neurology resetting itself. It's just the emotional detox. There's no need to measure it, manage it, or make it happen faster. Just notice the process taking place. Allow it to install itself completely. And when you know it's done, test it. Try to bring the old feelings back. Try to turn the new feelings off. And notice what happens instead. What did you guys notice? Some, some of you are still processing. Take your time. It's okay. Yes, sir. Finish. Yeah. See, that's how you know. Like, if sometimes kind of, one of the problems with doing a group is. You process at different speeds. So just keep processing, John. You're doing great, right? So that's level one of the transformational triad. Things are moving around. It's okay to let it go. Any reason why you might want to keep it? Okay. So what color is it? Green, okay. If your higher mind could send you a feeling, a frequency, a vibration, or a color that would completely dissolve it, what color or colors might it send you? Go ahead and breathe that red energy through that icky green energy that you obviously don't like. Let it flow into that area in an infinite, ever-expanding, and let the emotions come out. Yes, 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 that's why you're here. You see, one of the problems that we have, you just keep processing, sweetie, it's fine. One of the problems that we have is that when we start to move towards health, these emotions want to come out, and we got to let them. It's trying to deny it, trying to force it, trying to make things happen. That's what keeps them stuck. It's called the law of unconscious response. The more you try to will something to happen, the more you either get nothing or the inverse of what you're going for. You're doing good. Keep going. You got this. Okay? You got this. Let it happen. Right? Let the feelings come up, let them come out. That's why you're here. Once they come up, they come out, they're gone. Okay. Finding it is half the job. Allowing it to come out is the other half. Okay. So what I'm doing with um, with Karen right now is called color breathing. The first this is what we call level one. I do this with children. As a five-year-old can do this. You think you point to where you feel it, you close your eyes, you ask your neurology, what color is this feeling? First of all, you ask if it's okay to get rid of it. That's why we do the magic frame first. If there's any reason for holding on to it, the magic frame will, preserve, will, will, will extract that so it'll let the rest go. She's processing. Do you need another color? Where's it going? You're putting the smell in. Great. What smell makes it even better? She's olfactory, by the way. Yeah, go ahead and breathe that jasmine energy through that whole area and notice what happens. Ooh. See, she's one of the few people I met who's actually olfactory. Like if you go study NLP, you'll say that people are visuals and auditories and kids. She's not. She's olfactory. She starts doing smells and man, everything changes. But that's why a lot of people who work with her in the past, they were trying to force a visual or a kinesthetic representation. It couldn't, it just, eh. like, eh, eh. but you get the smells in there, boom. Right. And that's why she, she keeps coming back. Oh, you look better. Well done. Keep, you're going to be processing for a while. Drink lots of water, by the way. Now, how many of you noticed either you started young? How many got hot when I did that, when we started doing that? That's a, one of the things that happens. There's a big heat release that happens because you're accessing the fire element. There's, there's a thermogenic release as that energy that's locked in the cells lets go. Sometimes it's like, a, you, you ever open like a like a, a, an oven and this wave of hot energy? Air, air, a lot of times when you, when you tap into those bubbles, like, pfft, just, it just wells up. Okay, so color breathing is really simple. We've got some, um, Amy, do you have something else on your list? 
Well, you all have something on your list. We're going to do color breathing next, just for fun. Whatever. Okay. Unqualified? Would it be okay to get rid of that or change it? Yes. Come on up. We'll do this really quick. So we're going to play the color game. Now, I just did a full five-day training on the seven or eight levels to this, <laughs> but this is the one we can do really quick. Is it okay to change this? Is there any reason why you might want to keep it? Oh. you see it? Okay. One of the things you want to learn about is called the six dynamics of an unconscious response. Unconscious mind always answers first, always answers honestly, always feels like you're making it up, always have an urge to edit what just came up. It's never loud and it's never linear. When I asked you if it was okay to get rid of it, you went, no, yes, right? Okay, so we're going to do the magic frame instead. I was going to do color breathing, but we're going to do frame first, okay? This is why the frame is always done first. Is it okay to get rid of it? Okay, close your eyes. I'd like you to notice something, sweetie, that there's a place in your body where that feeling of being unqualified or that fear of being unqualified is stored, where it grows and where it spreads from. Take a moment, point to where you feel it. You guys can all sit down while I do this. If there were a picture floating in the space around you that represents that feeling, a picture that you could reach out and touch. Where would you reach out to touch it with the other hand? Excellent. Trace the outline of it with both of your hands. Excellent. Let's make sure we got the right one. Grab it with both of your hands. Make the picture bigger. Notice what happens to the feeling. Stronger or weaker? Excellent. Bring it back to its original size. Now, keep the size of the picture exactly the same. Pull it closer to your body. Stronger or weaker? Excellent. Put it back. Now, put a big, thick black frame around it. The bigger and thicker and blacker, the better. Excellent. Now, you're probably too young to remember when televisions had real dials and knobs and switches instead of touch screens and remote controls. But I want you to feel along the base of that frame. You're going to notice some dials and knobs and switches like on an old style television. I want you to find the knob that controls the brightness. Turn that all the way to the right until the image whites out completely. Notice how that makes you feel. Now turn it all the way to the left until the image blacks out completely. And notice how that makes you feel. Decide for yourself which one you like better. You have absolute permission to change this. Turn it all the way to the white. Now I want you to take the index finger of your dominant hand and in glowing golden letters on that whited out screen, I want you to write all the lessons that that experience had to teach you, positive or negative, so you can keep those lessons and let everything else go. Now, some people know exactly what those lessons are and boom, they just blast them out on the screen. Some people have no conscious idea what those lessons are. But the part of you that created this experience in the first place, it always knows. So let that part express itself. Some people draw squiggles. Some people draw lines. Some people write, fuck you, fuck you, because they get pissed off, right? Some people write with both hands simultaneously, like they're writing Chinese or Hebrew at the same time. However your body wants to do it, it's just how your body does it. When you know it's done, shrink it. Shrink that down to the size of a postage stamp or even smaller. Notice how the feelings in your body shift and change as your other than conscious mind moves that frame up over the top of your head, back beyond the horizon until it disappears completely. And you know the sound a hammer makes when you're banging on a nail. Feel it nailed back there for all eternity, impossible to come back. When you know it's nailed back there for all eternity, impossible to come back, test it. Try to bring those old feelings back and notice what happens instead. Scan your body. What do you notice? Lighter scale of zero to 10 rate the remaining feeling. Let the feelings come out. You're, you know, no tough little soldiers here. All right. If you got to cry, cry. That's what your safe place for you. Okay. Scale of zero to, now you notice it's, is, it, is, it, is it still fading or is it stopped? Yeah. yeah that, sometimes it takes a little longer to melt. We're just going to help it along a little bit if that's okay. Is that okay? Scale of zero to 10, rate the remaining feelings. Um, okay, close your eyes. If your higher mind, your autonomic nervous system, the part of you that controls your blood pressure, your heart rate, your immune system, if that part could send you a feeling, a frequency, a vibration, a color, that would completely dissolve that remaining feeling in your body that also has a color, and give you what you most need and want and desire instead. I'm curious, I'm wondering, what color or colors might it send you? Blue. Blue, I want you to imagine a beautiful ball of that energy floating above your head. Notice how the feelings in your body shift and change as that beautiful blue ball of energy begins to grow. 
begins to expand, begins to fill the entire room from floor to ceiling, from wall to wall and all points in between. Notice how it wraps itself around you with a beautiful blue embrace, a cocoon, a shield, a suit of armor, insulating you, protecting you from all feelings of not being good enough, not being qualified, real or imagined, while at the same time flooding your mind, flooding your body, flooding your spirit with everything it most wants, everything it most needs, in an infinite, ever-expanding and unlimited supply. And Amy, when you know you've got that, breathe those amazing colors through your entire being. Let it fill you up like water fills up a bottle, like fluid fills up a tube, like hot air helium fills up a balloon. But especially breathe it through that area where the colors connected to that old feeling that's fading away used to be. Till it's completely gone. And when it's completely gone, just nod your head to let me know. Try to bring it back and notice what happens instead. You notice? <laughs> Scale of zero to 10, rate the remaining feelings, if any. You don't feel it? Cool. Excellent. Give her a big round of applause, right? Now, Amy, you may feel emotions wanting to come up. Let them. That's your body purging what it no longer needs to hold on to. Drink lots of water. Okay. No, it's tough when you're in front of all these people. Like those feeling, you know, I can always tell when people are percolating, right? The problem we have is never the feelings we express that cause us the problems. It's the feelings we've conditioned ourselves to lock down. You understand that? It's the feelings that we refuse to face that make us sick, that hold us back. When we express it and we find the root cause of it and we change it at the source, everything shifts. Okay? Here's the best part. You're not going to believe me. And that's okay. You don't have to. For everything on your list that you want to change, even the ones you haven't written down yet, you've already beaten it. You know how I know? Because you're in this room. Because everything that has traumatized you, everything that has given you a limitation in your mind was an experience that you thought was going to kill you. No matter how logical that sounds, that's how it caused a trauma in the first place. The very fact that you're in this room means you beat everything that was trying to kill you, everything that was trying to hurt you. You beat it. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't be here. But that feeling we carry around that something's not quite right, that's just the check engine light on the dashboard. When you're driving down the road, and the check engine light goes off? Do you go rushing to the mechanic to fix the light? No. The light is just telling you there's something that needs tune-ups. Right? That's all those feelings are. Just a check engine light. You have the keys to fix it. You have the mechanic. You have the tools. Because if you can point to where you feel it, reach out and touch it, you can change it. Okay? We're not done yet. So let's talk about a little bit more about procrastination. I'm going to teach you a technique. It's a really sneaky one. Learned it from the Russian. It's called the procrastination blaster. The original technique was called the echo magnet. If you can find the book Red Gold, you'll probably wind up paying a ridiculous amount of money for it because it's out of print by Grigory Ryport. My procrastination blaster is based on his technique known as the echo magnet. So the first thing you're gonna, you're gonna do is you are going to pick something that you have to do that you don't wanna do. Oh, that's never happened, right? And you're gonna start with a, a very loud, emphatic, emotional statement, I must blank. So let's say, a, let's, maybe we're talking about paperwork. Right. I must do my paperwork. 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 And you're just going to build it and build it and just as much emotion as you can. Then you're going to drop it all. You're going to become completely indifferent. Couldn't give a shit about paperwork. And you're going to say to yourself. 
I don't want to blank. I don't want to do paperwork. 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 And you build it and you build it and you build it. And when you reach that emotional crescendo, go quiet. It's almost like the afterglow of an orgasm. Just go quiet. And then once you go quiet, Just wait. Within a few seconds, you'll start to hear a little voice in the back of your head. And it'll say something like, I want to do X. I want to do X. I want to do X. Let it build. When it reaches its crescendo, get up and do the thing that you just built the energy up for. Okay? This was one of the techniques. I don't, most of you weren't around in the 70s. Some of us were. But there was a time when the Russians, the Soviet Union, took like 70 gold medals in the U.S. Olympics. This piece is from the mental training system they all use for all their athletes. Okay? So, can we do this together? I want you to look at your list or think of something that you've been putting off that you have to do. This is, a, this is a, by the way, this is an immediate technique. Like there's something that I, the moment you do this, you got to get up and go do it. Understand? It's designed to break your cognitive inertia. So it's going to be a little chaotic doing this, but I want you to stand up. Stand up. I want you to think of something that you have to do that you don't want to do. And now I need you to vocalize this, right? It's going to get a little crazy, but everybody's going to be yelling and screaming at the same time. So it's all good, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to start you off and then I'm going to let you go. But here's the secret. You got to build the emotion into this. You got to get the meat engaged, okay? Ready? I must do. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> I must speak out loud. I must speak out loud. I must speak out. <laughs> Let's do that one. Okay. I must speak out loud. 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 Quiet. I don't want to speak out loud. 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 What's happening? Damn. What's happening? How are you feeling? It's okay to speak out loud? Yeah. <laughs> See? Now we just get up and now pick something on your list that you want to, you, you got to go do. You ready? I must. 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 I must! I must! When you reach that emotional peak. I don't want to. 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 Uh-huh. You ready? That quick. And yes, I can get you to do shit you don't want to do. <laughs> right? Simple, right? Simple, simple. I got more, but I'm out of time. 
So if you had a good time tonight, please post good things to the meetup. If you didn't have a good time, post to somebody else's meetup. There will be more events, right? If you want to, if you want to find out more about all the things, the services, the products, the courses that we offer, check in with Moss. Give yourselves a big round of applause. You're an amazing audience. To our folks on YouTube, hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you in a couple of days. We got a webinar coming up on uh, September 28th. It's uh, Weapons of Social Seduction, Defense Against the Dark Arts of Psychological Manipulation. Uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel. You guys are invited to come and join us. In the words of the immortal Cal Burnett, I'm so glad we had this time together just to have a laugh or sing a song. Seems we just got started. And before you know it, comes the, the time we have to say. So, good night, my friends. We'll see you next time. Thank you.